meeting of the Joint Committee on Drug Use. The remit of the committee is to provide a reasoned response to all 36 recommendations made by the Citizens' Assembly on drug use within a seven-month time frame. Uh, we hope to engage with a wide range of shareholders, including providing, uh, sorry, before providing uh, the reasoned responses. Uh, the committee has held some private meetings to agree a work programme and uh, has agreed to work in modules. It's hoped to complete the modules, bef uh, two modules before the summer recess. Members of the Joint Committee on Drug Use are committed to working together and with all those who engage with the committee to examine the issues raised by the Citizens' uh, Assembly uh, and in its report. Drug use is a complex and important issue, and we're all aware of this. As Cahirlac, I will fulfil my duties to set out understanding orders. This includes allocating time fairly to members to put questions, while ensuring that witnesses have sufficient time to reply to questions asked, and ensuring that contributions are relevant to the matter under discussion. Um, the purpose of today's meeting uh, is to engage with the Citizens' Assembly on drug use, uh, who, of course, um, considered this issue over a, a very long period of time. We're joined here today by Paul Reid, Chair of the Citizens' Assembly on Drug Use, Cahill O'Regan, Secretary of the Citizens' Assembly on uh, Drug Use, Professor Johanna Ivers and Brian Galvin, who are members of the Advisory Support Group, and um, Kira Moynihan and Graham O'Neill, who are members of the Citizens' Assembly on Drug Use. You're all very welcome. I wish to apologise for keeping you waiting this morning. Uh, we were attending to um, housekeeping matters. I do apologise of keeping you waiting. Uh, no disrespect was intended and I hope uh, none was taken from the delay. Uh, but you're very welcome here today and I wish to invite uh, Mr Reid to give his opening statement on behalf of the Assembly. Chairperson, Deputies and Senators, on behalf of the members of the Citizens' Assembly on Drug Use, thank you for the invitation to meet with your committee. Our delegation includes several people who are closely involved in the work of the Citizens' Assembly. Uh, Chair, you've introduced the delegation, so I won't reintroduce them again. The Citizens' Assembly on Drug Use has been an example of deliberative democracy at its very best. Our terms of reference ask us to consider the legisl legislative policy and operational changes that the state could make to significantly reduce the harmful impacts of illicit drugs on individuals, families, communities and wider society. I'm pleased to report that we've completed our mission in full and on schedule. Before you today is the end result a two-volume report that sets out what I believe to be the most thorough and far-reaching examination of drug use undertaken in the state. The report reflects the reality that the causes and consequences of drug use are multifaceted. It also emphasises the need for the state to respond to these challenges with urgency and indeed ambition. The Citizens' Assembly recommendations support specific measures for implementation, including, for example, a decriminalised model, pivoting from reliance on a criminal justice response to a comprehensive health-led response. We have described this as an Irish model for the Irish problem on illicit drug use. Strengthened political oversight and accountability to the establishment of a dedicated Cabinet Committee on Drugs, chaired by the Taoiseach. Prioritisation of supports for marginalised groups and disadvantaged communities. Enhanced funding, including additional and new sources of funding. A greater focus on prevention and recovery. Greater supports for families and children impacted by drug use. Strengthened services, including the expansion of harm reduction measures and treatment and recovery services, both in prison and at a community level. Supply reduction supporting the continued efforts of Angarda Sheikhana while strengthening the response to drug related intimidation and violence by organised crimes, crime gangs. The report documents many important con contributions to the Citizens' Assembly made by expert practitioners, stakeholders, and very importantly, service users and people with lived and indeed living experience of drug use. We learned that while drug use is prevalent in all parts of the country and among all socio-economic groups, we can clearly tell that the vulnerable groups and disadvantaged communities suffer disproportionately. We learned how addiction and dependency can destroy lives. We heard that organised crime gangs are inflicting drug-related intimidation and violence in cities, towns and villages across Ireland and are luring vulnerable young people into criminality at an early age. We heard also about the limitations of the state's response which has not substantively evolved in several decades. We were stunned by the length of time it takes to introduce even modest changes in, in this area. The Assembly members were frustrated and disappointed that even the most modest proposals for a health diversion programme sig signalled in the 2017 National Drug Strategy and in the current programme for government have still not been implemented. This would have at least been a starting point from a health-led approach. We were concerned by the inadequate provision of drug services in the community settings and the prison system. We heard how shame and stigma compounds the harms experienced by individuals, families 
and families affected by drug use. And time and time again, we heard that simply criminalising people is no way to deal with the drug problem. In response, the Citizens' Assembly has, re, uh, has recommended a comprehensive package of 36 recommend, me, measures and recommendations. These aim to ensure that the state and the stakeholders respond urgently, effectively and decisively to a full range of issues. We firmly believe that all 36 recommendations need to be adopted. Tackling issues in relation to isolation in, in isolation will simply not work. We fully respect the role of the Directors Committee now and the next phase of this process, but we would call for urgency from Government and believe that our recommendations could and should be implemented in full. We are acutely aware that for tens of thousands of people in this country who are affected by drug use, the clock is ticking. People's lives and futures are on the line. There is no time to waste. We believe that this report offers a, a new paradigm. We have, I hope, broadened the national conversation about drugs and narrow focus, and from a narrow focus on debates about legislation and decriminalisation. The Assembly consisted of 100 members, 99 of whom were randomly selected from the general public and myself as independent chair. Our demographic profile perfectly mirrored wider Irish society in terms of age, gender and location. The group was also diverse in terms of socio-economic profile, nationality and disability status. Importantly, our members held diverse perspectives on drug use, with people from all walks of life coming from various levels of experience of drugs and addiction. In respect of their backgrounds and personal experience, each and every member made an invaluable contribution and assured that the Assembly was informed by a wide spectrum of opinions reflective of Irish society generally. With six weekend meetings heard from 130 presenters over um, and over 15 hours of questions and answers, 250 hours of, of roundtable deliberations, we also received almost 800 public submissions. We heard from eminent experts at international, EU and national level. We grounded our deliberations in empirical evidence, including from the Health Research Board and the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction. Most importantly, we included practitioners, service providers and people with lived and living experience. Despite the diverse profile of our members, there was a very strong consensus of support in most of our recommendations. Of the 36 recommendations, 31 were supported by over 90% of the members, while another four were supported by over 80% of the members. The only issue which revealed a significant divergence of perspectives was in relation to the possession of cannabis for personal use. Even then, there was a strong consensus that the status quo isn't working and we need to adopt a new approach. Chair, if I may, I'd like to very briefly summarise our recommendations. Recommendations 1 to 6 focus on the need for urgent decisive action by the state and for drugs policy to be prioritised by government. Among other things, they call for a dedicated cabinet committee on drugs, chaired by in Taoiseach. Recommendations 7 to 10 focus on a whole of government, whole of society response to drug use, with a new national drug strategy built on a partnership between the state and the stakeholders. Recommendations 11 to 14 focus on policy and services for people with underlying drug problems who are engaged with the criminal justice system. They call for more community-based and residential drug services to give the judiciary greater options to divert people away from convictions and custodial sentence towards appropriate help. They also call for more drug, for more drug treatment services within the prison system. Recommendations 15 to 16 uh, focus on improving service delivery and improving targeted services for vulnerable and marginalised groups. Recommendation 17 relates to how the state should deal with the possession of drugs for personal use. The Assembly has recommended a comprehensive health-led approach informed by international examples including Portugal and Austria and others. While possession of con controlled drugs would remain illegal and prohibited by law, anyone found in possession of drugs for personal use would be afforded first and foremost extensive opportunities to engage with the health-led services. Recommendations 18 to 21 focus on funding of services and include a recommendation to examine potential novel sources of funding. Recommendations 22 and 23 focus on workforce development and providing trauma-informed training to key personnel. Recommendation 24 calls for a continued focus on the efforts of the law enforcement to reduce supply of drugs working at international, EU, national and lo local levels. Recommendation 26 calls for a zero-tolerance approach to drug-related intimidation and violence and continued strategic focus on tackling this issue at a community level. Recommendations 27 and 28 focus on prevention, emphasising the need for Ireland to improve its approach to primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. Recommendation 29 calls for a public health communication strategy focusing on reducing shame and stigmatisation, drug prevention, risk mitigation and adver advertising drug services. Recommendation 30 calls for a systemic approach to recovery with funding for evidence-based innovation in the provision of residential and community-based recovery services. Recommendation 31 calls for a strategy to enhance resilience, mental health, well-being and, pre and prevention capital across the population, including therapeutic supports for children and young people. Recommendation 32 and 33 focus on improving the state's response to drug use through innovation, evidence 
and data. Recommendation 34 refers to the submissions received by the Citizens' Assembly to the Department of Health in the context of the work in preparing the next iteration of the National Drug Strat Strategy. Recommendation 36 refers onwards to the appropriate re regulatory authorities' submissions received by the Citizens' Assembly, which relate to the potential therapeutic benefits of cannabis and plant-based psychedelic substances. Finally, Recommendation 36 calls for more widespread use and rapid adoption of evidence-based approaches to harm reduction. In conclusion, Chair, we believe that the Citizens' Assembly has been the most comprehensive, inclusive, transparent and informed examination of illicit drug use that has ever taken place in the state. This is why I urge the Oireachtas and the Government to embrace this new paradigm. With the right ambition, resourcing, leadership, strategic direction and determination, we can fundamentally transform how Ireland deals with drugs now and into the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reid. Um, just before in inviting members to ask questions, I just have one very brief question, and then I'm going to um, ask um, Senator Ruan, who's the vice chair, to chair the meeting. You rightly pointed out that the, the, the assembly, um, or the, the makeup of the assembly, and that it reflects the, the national de demographic in terms of age, gender, etc. Just I, a very brief procedural question: How that was achieved, and by whom? Um, who carried out the selection process? So the process is administered by the uh, Secretariat, uh, called Regan and the same here. In essence, it's, a, it's what's called a stratified random selection process. So uh, about 20,000 letters issue out to general public. Um, of that, we get our responses back, which was less than 2,000 responses back. Uh, from that, we basically utilise the CSO data and identify the population mix that reflects CSO data. So it will reflect geography, regional distribution, it will reflect, as best we can, socio-economic background. It will reflect nationality and even in terms of disability. So we had a real good mix and 12 nationalities represented in the Assembly. So it represents the CSO data of the population. And just in terms of the people originally written out to of whom a, a, a proportion replied, how are they selected or from what database are they selected? Uh, so it's a... Um, it's a database provided by OnPost. Uh, it's called GeoDirectory, so it's the most comprehensive database in the country of all households. So every household in the country essentially is in the mix to be selected as one of the 20,000. And so out of the 2.3 million, we get a random selection of 20,000 that reflects the population distribution around the country. And from that 20,000, then, the applicants are whittled down to 99. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. I'd just like to invite members to chair and also invite uh, Senator Ruan, who's elected, uh, or, uh, uh, was uh, elected as, as vice chair of the committee at our previous meeting to chair the remainder of it. Again, I wish to say that it's, I don't wish to, um, I hope no disrespect, no, I intend absolutely no disrespect. I just I have to go to another meeting and I apologise. Uh, thank you very much okay, for coming chair. here today and for all the information you. that you've provided. Thank you, thank you. Senator. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go straight into questions uh, from the members, so I now invite members to ask questions, and first up is Senator Mary Fitzpatrick. Ramagat Kerlock, and thank you all for being here today, and thank you for all the work that you have done to get us this far um, with the Citizens' Assembly, uh, incredible piece of work, and this is, an, uh, I suppose, an incredibly important issue for us um, as an Oireachtas committee, but as a society generally. When you look at the stats of 20% of our young people using drugs, when you look at Ireland being the second highest user of M M MDMA, when you see the carnage that it's wrecking in uh, our communities, um, we have a very serious responsibility as an Oireachtas committee to build on the work that the Citizens' Assembly undertook. Um, so I sincerely thank the Citizens' Assembly for that piece of work. Uh, it's long overdue. Uh, we have to move forward. It's, uh, it would be completely unacceptable and negligent of us uh, not to respond comprehensively to the uh, recommendations. The fact that there's 36 recommendations <laughs> kind of indicates 
the enormity uh, of the task, and um, I know, you know, a comprehensive, there's no point in us doing this piecemeal. Uh, it has to be comprehensive, it has to be holistic. And the Citizens' Assembly rightly, I think, took a person-centred, a, a, a victim um, a first uh, approach to your workings and a health-led uh, approach to it. And your recommendations uh, all reflect that. I suppose the depressing part when, when I read all of your um, documents was the enormity of effort, I think, that has already, and I want to acknowledge that, that has already gone in by people who work in this space. Um, people in our health service, people in our drugs task forces, people in community services, um, the Gardaí, um, and others who work with victims uh, of drugs, and the individual victims themselves, the addicts, their families, their communities. And it's really depressing to think that we're this far on and uh, the hundreds of millions that are being spent and the human effort that is going in to try and uh, defeat this. Um, so I approach the task, our task, with um, real caution and real concern um, because it, it, it is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity that we have as an Oireachtas Committee to get this right. Um, but it's going to require very strong recommendations and, and those recommendations are going to have to have an all of state, not just an all of government, but an all of state um, approach to it. They're going to have to be recommendations that we can get communities all around the country to buy into um, on, a, on a voluntary basis and then all of the state's resources applied to making them happen. Um, I have a lot of questions um, and I've only a couple of minutes. Uh, I, I think that as these uh, meetings progress, we'll come back and, and forth. Um, so we'd appreciate if we can come back to you just offline, even um, with questions uh, and queries, that, that would be very useful. Um, I, I suppose, I, I think in making whatever recommendations we're making, our, our guiding principle has to be to try and do no more harm than is already being done and to try and um, increase the potential for drug reduction, drug, uh, the re reduction of damage, um, the increase of recovery, um, and to support communities and individuals uh, to recover, rehabilitate, and be stronger and more resilient. Um, I, I'm really struck by, I, 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 and the whole health side of it, we, we, we'll deal with at, at another um, meeting, but. It, it, of all of, of the setting of the agenda for, and this is just a, a kind of a, an understanding for me, in, in setting the agenda for your meetings, how did you determine that, um, the topics? How, how was that determined? Was it determined by the Citizens' Assembly or how did that happen? Can you just explain that to me? Responses uh, to just firstly the data I agree with you is really concerning. Even if you look at 2020 data again republished by HRB, Ireland ranks as the worst in the EU for drug induced deaths. Uh, so we are a complete outlier in terms of our response. The 36 recommendations, just to say to you, it may sound like yes, it's 36. Uh, just a couple of points on that. Number one, we were very anxious that the whole debate didn't just harbour on the one issue of criminalisation, decriminalisation, legalisation. It's much bigger than that, so that's why we reach out much further. And by comparison with the previous assembly on biodiversity, I think they had 170 recommendations in there. So we tried to keep it as tight and as focused as we could. Uh, just uh, specifically to say that in terms of the st structure of the meetings agenda, we looked at this, the seven months of work that we had, the six assembly meetings that we had. We put a structure around us, which is a combination of, firstly, a steering group comprised of six of the assembly members, and, and two of the assembly members are here, last time we talked about that. Uh, so they looked at what they felt was engendered. For, so separately, we had an advisory steering group, which we put together, which had people, including Johanna Ivers, here is with us today, uh, people with very different public views uh, given in terms of relation to har reducing harm caused by drugs. So some people who would, uh, let's say, be more liberal in their views and some people more stringent or, or stricter or even being perceived as prohibitionist. Mm -hmm. So we had a wide range of spectrum okay. for us there. Thirdly, we had a legal advisory group uh, to work with us to give us a bit more depth about the complex issues because 
Some people talk about legalisation, but they mean decriminalisation. Some people talk about decrim and they mean legalisation. So we wanted to get a, a better grounding, so they advise us along the process. And then, finally, we took feedback from, at the end of each assembly meeting, did people feel the agenda was, or were there any other items that they would like on it? So it was quite comprehensive uh, in terms of setting the agenda, and the Secretariat worked with people. If, if it's if, and appropriate when we get a chance, I would ask one of my colleagues, maybe Kira or, or Graham, just to give their perspective on how we shaped it. Yeah. Mm. Can we? Yeah, um, so it was um, as part of the steering group, we were a point of contact for um, assembly members. So we met before the assembly meetings took place, two or three um, meetings before the assembly took place, and did have an input into kind of how it was. Um, arranged and how the, the the day went. If that was you know something as menial as the time that was given to certain ter certain speakers or um, breaks, etc. The the assembly members did have a choice to go to um, the the six steering group members and voice their concerns as well. So we did as as an as a, as members of the assembly have an input into um, how the meeting took place and, and what speakers and we were given advanced um, kind of agendas. So we did have an input into how um, the meeting took place as members of the assembly and the steering group. And if if I might just add that the if you like the the the, the agenda for each of the six meetings flowed initially from the terms of reference that the Iraq has set. And so there's a very detailed terms of reference within the within the motion establishing the Citizens' Assembly. So everything derived from that, that became, if you like, an overarching, that provided us an overarching work program, which is really how do you schedule in a limited amount of time, how do you fit everything into six meetings, which really was only five substantive meetings because the final meeting number six was all about voting. Sure. So five meetings to fit everything into was a quieter in order. We came up with a draft work programme that sort of said, let's start at meeting number one, focusing on these issues and work our way down through. That was given to the members and members gave us feedback about things that they felt needed to be resequenced or reprioritised. So the final work programme effectively was based on the input from the members. And then, as Paul and, and Graham have described, the the advisory group and the steering group also had inputs in helping us finesse down the individual meeting programs. Sorry, Chair, there's one important group I did leave out, apologies, mm -hmm. was the lived experience group. Yeah, so okay. we had people who have yeah, lived, lived experience at an individual level, community level, family level, uh, and they we met them twice weekly in between meetings, uh, or bi-weekly, and they would you know, assess the agenda with us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Girl, I'm going to move on now to um, Deputy Ward. Thanks, Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to commend the members of the Citizens' Assembly, the, the chairperson and everybody that was involved and gave their exp expertise to the project. I think it was a really, really worthwhile exercise. And, and it's, it, the fact that we're here today uh, is testament to that. My own professional background, I was talking to you, Mr. Ray, before around that, is, is working in frontline addiction services um, right across Dublin, uh, addiction and recovery services. And, and I've seen services that have to change over the years which, and adapt to the circumstances around their, around their area, but not being supported by either government policy or by the HSE, and, and that has always been a, a, a barrier. I'm from North and Dock myself. It's, a, it's an area that I'm really, really proud of. Um, but everything in our area, that, everything that's in our area, my community had to go out and fight to nail my parents, my neighbours, uh, other members of our community. And I'm talking about from the most basics of services, like of schools, um, transport, even the local shop at one stage, we had to go out and fight to nail for. Um, and what needs to be explored here, it, it is an area that is disproportionately affected by addiction, but it's also an area that's disproportionately affected by poverty. And poverty underpins a hell of a lot of, of, of areas that are impacted by trauma and, and, and poverty, and then will lead to high levels of uh, addiction and, and adverse drug use. Um, as I said, I've seen too many of my peers succumb to a life addiction, also family members as well over the years as well succumb to a life addiction. Um, and I don't think some people had an alternative. Uh, it was just that was there and that was their way. Like addiction to me is, and drug use is, is an escapism and it's a way of, that's why it's called getting out of your head. It's, it's the getting out wherever's going on, whether it's poverty, whether it's, it's an area of trauma and it's an escapism and then con continuous drug use can lead to problematic drug use which can lead to addiction as well. Um, I have a couple. Of, I have one question on just in particular, but like one of the biggest um, scourges in, in my community and other communities like mine is drug debt intimidation. Like people are afraid to ask the guards uh, 
for help for fear of reprisals. Uh, families often cannot pay back exaggerated drug debts by unscrupulous do uh, to unscrupulous drug dealers. And I mean exaggerated because often what they say is old is multiplied ten times um, and, and, and parents are often put in a, a situation, or young people are often put in a situation where they, they, they have to go and do things that they wouldn't normally do to in order to get the money to pay back these uh, unscrupulous dealers. And that's where the intimidation uh, Aspect comes in. I'm aware of the Dry Project. So I've, I've, I've linked in with them myself before. Uh, we have we have one kind of partial one in my area in in, in Kandakan. But I'd be interested to hear what other solutions and barriers were discussed at the Citizens Assembly in relation to um, drug debt intimidation. I think it was in re in relation to recommendation 26. If, if you can start with that. And again, I would defer to my colleagues, some who are practi practitioners in this area. Just the whole issue you said about social deprivation, I'm, I'm glad you raised it early in the debate because that became very clear to us very early in great depths. Uh, like yourself, I come from an area of Finglas West, which is high social deprivation, uh, and witnessed many of the issues of drugs and the intimidation and violence that goes with it and harm. Um, but And the issue of trauma, which jumped out at us at a very early uh, where the lived experience of basically describing uh, people who went through early life trauma, got to use drugs to numb the pain, yeah. numb the issue, uh, got involved in, then got criminal convictions, then ended up in prison and ended up in a whole vicious cycle. Uh, and that was the cycle that we were really anxious in our recommendations to break, uh, that vicious cycle of criminality, uh, where there were other issues to be addressed. Yeah, so we get that. Just in terms of the um, drive project, I'm very familiar with them. They did present to us, and I was with them yesterday at another presentation, and very impressed by them. I might just ask her, Hannah Ivers, just who is a practitioner in the whole area of recovery and addiction, uh, and just particularly on, the, on your issues there, and then we'll get to uh, recommendation 26 specifically. Thanks, Deputy Ward. So just to clarify, I, well, prior to going to academia, I did work in frontline services for seven years. So, um, I and all my research is translational. So I deal with the community a lot. But I, I suppose I guess I feel a bit of a fraud calling myself a, a practitioner today. Um, but I suppose just to say that the programme did represent other community-based services that were dealing with young people uh, around building up uh, supports for intimidation. But I suppose just to acknowledge what you said earlier on, which is the notion that every community in Ireland is under pressure to scrap for service, and every community in Ireland is trying to come out and fight to fill this comprehensive response to address somebody's drug use. So in other words, trying to find someone a house in the middle of a housing crisis, yeah. trying to get them into education when our numbers have never been high, higher, trying to get them a job in a market that calls for so much skill. So the, the pressure that we're putting our health system under and our communities really is something that has to stop. And I think you're right, the acknowledgement that poverty is the driver of addiction has been something that I suppose has acknowledged, we've acknowledged since as far back as the Rabbit Report, which was really good, but the, our solution is very much uh, focused on treatment. And so if you've got a person that's addicted because they're in poverty and then you treat the addiction, you're doing nothing about the poverty. So ultimately it's about building up community supports, putting resources back to communities, driving things like Paul talked about, where we have people with lived and living experience at the centre of our services. But this, you know, de the other deputy talked about the notion of um, a whole government approach. And yes, we need a whole government approach, but at the moment we have coordination from our cross-sectoral partners. We need absolute buy-in and we need those other agencies and those other sectors to really strategize around recovery and prevention in a way that they would if we were talking about economic recovery. So that's the whole government approach that we really need. Um, and I think until we do that, we'll still have communities like your own and communities like mine and from the north inner city on their knees and struggling and pushing back and fighting and scrapping for resource. So, yeah, ultimately it is about building up those uh, supports and addressing the, you know, underlying issues like drug intimidation as well. Thank you. Can we just come to 26? Um, so very briefly, very briefly I, the, the recommendation 26 is a good example of how you 
sort of can't tackle these issues in a piecemeal fashion. So on the one hand, members of the Assembly voted for a zero tolerance approach to drug related intimidation and violence and every effort that can be made by community groups and the drive initiative etc to tackle that issue but not ignoring for example recommendation 14 that says in parallel then the state should take um, develop alternative pathways for young people that are being lured into a life of criminality at an early age vulnerable young people in communities so it's recognising we heard a huge amount of concern about the role of criminal gangs bringing young people in at an early age for low-level distribution. Yeah. So we're sort of recognising the complexity of the problem here and saying that there's different parts of the solution. So one is zero tolerance with the criminal activities of drug-related intimidation and violence, but at the same time taking a much more um, sensible approach to helping young people. And we heard a lot of input from community development workers, youth workers and so on talking about the, the challenges that they have at community level, trying to counteract the influence of criminal gangs in this area. So um, there's a range of different recommendations in there that speak about the social determinants of drug use, the need for a focus on community development and trying to resolve the underlying problems, as you said, of poverty and deprivation, but at the same time, not giving leeway to the criminal gangs that sort of manipulate and, and uh, damage the lives of so many young people. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to go to actually Deputy uh, McAuliffe. Um, well, I want to be in the same time. Yeah, and then, and then to Deputy Shanahan. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I suppose. This is my second committee now where we're where I'm dealing with a report of a citizen assembly, the previous one, actually it's the third one, the third one being, uh, the other ones being the gender equality one and the directly elected mayor and I suppose I've got a little bit more of an insight of the how the citizens assembly uh, works. Um, I suppose I'd like to maybe give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the criticisms that uh, arose on the, at the voting um, on the last day. And I suppose they arose online and uh, from people that weren't in the room. And I just think it's a good opportunity for you to maybe talk about, um, about that process and, and why those criticisms arose. Chair, Deputy, just a couple of things. We, we highlight in the open statement the vast majority of support for the vast majority of our recommendations came from the Assembly members. So um, the one which did uh, have a, a very narrow margin of a vote was the issue related to uh, cannabis. So ultimately, our votes reflected for all drugs, we took generic approach to all drugs, should move to a decriminalised approach, move from the current criminal justice system. Uh, it was obvious throughout the debate that the issue around cannabis and cannabis use for personal possession uh, was going to be a contentious one. It was a contentious one throughout the debates, and we're glad that we had that debate and we had a wide spectrum of, of views on it. The voting process that was worked throughout all of the votes uh, was led by an international expert on, on, on polling and, and voting, and they worked through every vote. So before every vote, every person was explained exactly what was on the ballot paper, what was being voted on, how it would be counted. Uh, and it is, it's, it's a fact that the one vote in relation to cannabis use, whether it should be legalised or decriminalised, uh, it was a difference of one vote. Uh, so yes, there, there was understandable angst among some members who really wanted to see that approach adopted, uh, and others who felt, you know, we took the right approach. Having, my, having, having come from a weekend of narrow margins uh, and, <laughs> and disappointment, I can, I can understand that. I suppose the question was, um, do you feel it was clear enough that uh, uh, subsidiary preferences um, would 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 kick in once once your first preference was eliminated. Do you think that was understood in the room? Was there confusion? Or, or, yeah. No, no. Look, I, I believe overall it was. Uh, there were certainly um, voices expressed that maybe it wasn't for some people. Yeah. Uh, and that's fair enough. Uh, it, it, it's not a simple process when you're balloting on, on a multi-choice uh, voting system. So it's not simple. It was explained thoroughly. If you look back through the. The live video recordings, if you ever have a chance, uh, it, it's very clear. I, I did, I did the, watch them, yeah. The amount of time given to the pre-voting uh, process. But maybe, if, if, if it's okay, Deputy, one of the members here might like to comment on it. Yeah, that'd be useful, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy, for the question. Um, I think if the outcome had been different, potentially, uh, we wouldn't have heard those criticisms. So it is the one issue that is quite divisive, emotive, um, people are at either side of the spectrum. There's no middle ground on it. And certainly around the roundtable discussions, people were either one way or the other. And 
I think you can quickly go down a rabbit hole with that whole discussion. And I would urge the committee to consider it seriously because there are other issues on the table that are extremely important. I'm not saying that this issue isn't important, but it's not going to resolve the matters in our society, yeah. whether cannabis is legalised or not. And I think that was the, that was the view yeah. around the table. Thank you. Just as members of the Assembly, um, given that it was a tight margin, uh, do you believe that the Oireachtas, I believe the Oireachtas have the right to act whatever, however we wish, and the Citizens' Assembly is an advisory, but do you think it would be in keeping with the uh, Citizens' Assembly uh, report and recommendations if we were to take a view on that, given that it was, so, that it was so, so, such a tight margin? I, I might come in on this and say I think it's very important to give it, as, as Keir said, it's very important to give it its due course, but also remember that the, the members of the Assembly voted in a particular way, and if there was any um, inclination to divert from that that vote, I think it would undermine the process in general. I think to e go to your... E even given the very tight margin on... And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm not specifically talking about that issue or that debate... I suppose it's the point that this is a very fu uh, a nuanced debate, um, and I suppose the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly uh, on that issue were very narrow, and in my view, that leaves the Oireachtas the freedom to, to take it um, and then uh, uh, and to respond to it, but given that it was such a narrow margin. I, I think, it, 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 well, it, that's true in a sense. I think, it, again, if, if we're to take away from the fact and take maybe a different viewpoint to what was recommended, I think, again, it would undermine the, the, the whole process because at the end of the day, the vote was cast and, you know, the die was cast and it was done and it, 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 the result came out the way it did. I think to, to divert from the result would then call into question why yeah. would we do it for one recommendation and not do it in total for the process. So. I, have loads of, I have loads of more questions and I hope, I hope to come back in. Sorry, Paul. Yes. Absolutely, in your own we really respect that. Uh, yeah. inside, whatever. Just at the point we are trying to make is that, you know, that one vote and that one difference of one vote doesn't get to the essence of the seven months of debate that we had. And what we believe is a solution to the whole issue of drugs, including cannabis, is in the report. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I just say then, I, I fully agree, and I just wanted to, to yeah. give you an opportunity to address those issues, because they are being uh, addressed public, publicly. I have loads more questions on all the other issues of complexity. Uh, I will, if I get a chance to come back in. I just want to thank, in particular, the members of the Citizens' Assembly. It's a big chunk of your, of your time to give up. Uh, I'm sure you weren't in any way expert on the area, and you probably feel like you, you've gained huge experience. So thank you so much for your It was an absolute privilege, I think, for all of the 99 members who were selected. Um, we didn't know very much about drugs, a lot of us, before we attended. Um, we can tell you that we came with an open mind. We considered the lived experience in particular, the community effect, the effect on families, the effect of the behavioural, this recreational drug use. We're not getting... This, this is fueling the issue in this country. And people aren't understanding that message. If you're going out on a Saturday night and you're, you're reaching for a pill or a bag of cocaine, we need to get the message out that you need to think of that seven-year-old in a marginalised um, society with no parental support, with, as, Dep as Deputy Ward indicated, the, a cycle, that they're in this cycle in, in the area. And it's extremely difficult to pull yourself out of it. And I would like the prevention this assembly to focus on the prevention, what we can do in that regard, so that we can inform people that when you go out, the choices you make, you're part of the problem here. We're all part of the problem, but we're all part of the solution. So that's the message I'd like to get out there. Thank you. Just a small comment, because we need to move on to Deputy Shanahan. Yeah. Just very briefly, Deputy, just to put on the record that with the tightness of, of that particular vote you're referring to, we did a full recount on the day and got the very same result. And I did a post hoc audit, if you like, of the of the balloting papers. So I can kind of confidently say that there was every evidence that people understood the single transferable voting process. And there was no question that there was any confusion on the ballot papers. So it's uh, just to say that, as far as we're concerned, everything was above board and in order with the result of that vote. Okay. Thank you. Um, Deputy Shanahan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks to uh, the guests this morning. And 
want to congratulate you all for your participation. I know you've done a great body of work and, uh, and you've uh, practiced great diligence in trying to come to your recommendations and all of that. Um, if I might synopsize basically what I have taken from it, right, okay, obviously decriminalization for personal use is high up on the agenda, a health-led approach, uh, the greater political and uh, policy supports that's going to be required, uh, increased resourcing right across the spectrum, including for recovery services and addiction. Uh, and these are all multifaceted problems, and I would say to you they are also societal problems, and the question is how much all of this can do to actually change what's happening in society with relation to uh, the, the issue of cannabis and the divergence of opinion on cannabis. One, one of the things I'd like to understand is cannabis is not the drug it was 20, 30 years ago, and the addiction rates of cannabis are far different to what they were, and, and the, uh, the, the, the impacts of cannabis, particularly for uh, younger uh, users, are starting to become known in terms of psychiatric services. So just well, where was that taken into account in terms of trying to look at cannabis, because it is probably considered as a soft drug in comparison to some of the others, potentially. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say to you was in relation to community sports. Uh, can someone tell me what do you believe is working at the moment and what's not working? And I'm close to Ashari and Warford. I've been in there a number of times. They do great work, particularly in terms of the penal system and, and addiction recovery and trauma is absolutely there and marginalisation of society is absolutely there. But it's not all of it. Uh, there is the push and pull factor of drugs being forced on communities and people, unfortunately, for whatever reason, being open to drugs. And I would make the point to you, uh, just talking about when you talk about marginalised societies, uh, societies and trauma, that doesn't explain the rise of fentanyl use in Ivy League universities in America, which is what's coming here also. So there is, you know, people are unfortunately predisposed to try things and get in on things for whatever reasons. It isn't always just about uh, at the level of, of um, you know, affluence or otherwise uh, that's there. And I think another big factor that we have here, and we're seeing it now with, with drugs entering the country here, is, uh, you know, we've got the pull factor of people using it and you've got the push. But there is a criminal enterprise here. There's in international criminal syndicates. And the ability of, the, of our state to tackle all of this is limited. And I suppose just in terms of those, I think, you know, it's a different... The conversation here is very important. <coughs> Education is very important. It's really hard to know, like, what, how do we build from where we are now based on what you've put into your report here? Like, what can we do first that's going to give us the best output uh, with, with the limited amount of resources that we have? Thank you. Comments in response. Uh, first of all, what can we do? Our strong view, and it's in my opening statement, is we have wasted, since 2017, we've wasted seven years when a small approach was agreed in the strategy to move a small way forward in terms of a health-led approach uh, and not rooting people through the criminal justice system. That was in the programme for government in 2019. It's 2024. That has gone nowhere. So what small things can we do? Act at pace in terms of it. We set out that we do need to legislate. We're not recommending that approach, by the way. We considered that approach that's on the shelves in 2017, and we rejected it. We said, no, we need to go further in terms of a comprehensive-led approach. We need to have issues of diversion and dissuasion encompassed in it. So we went further. Secondly, we believe, and other deputies have said it here, this being a whole-of-government approach needs, needs to go over a whole-of-government structure around it. So we really urge that a cabinet committee a dedicated cabinet committee is set up on the whole issue of drugs, that it reports annually, that it assesses the impacts, someone considers all the data, uh, and that is chaired by Antishock. I've worked two cabinet committees throughout my career in the public service. They work. It does get the key principles around the table. It does hold people to account. So they are practical things that can be done, uh, pace with the legislation, uh, pace with the cabinet committee. After that, we do agree, and I think Deputy Ward said it earlier on, you know, addressing the drugs issue is not addressing the whole of society issues and the whole of social deprivation issues that happen. Uh, but it has, to be, it has to be addressed, and the way we feel it's addressed is, is a wider 36 recommendations that's in there. You, when you talk about what's working, we saw great examples all across the country of community and voluntary services that are working. Some of them are a combination of the statutory services like the HSC working with community and voluntary sector and are excellent and they work. Some of them are, for example, a court system, a dedicated drugs court here in Dublin and one in Cork, that it takes a fundamentally different approach. It's working, rooting people through an education system. That 
That issue in the Dublin Drugs Court is a pilot now for 20 years. We had Judge Anne Ryan on our advisory committee advising us. It's a pilot for 20, 20 years. It's working. Roll the thing out. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're kind of practical things we believe that can work. And sorry, on the services in particular, there's a couple of practical issues that, you know, if you are relying on the community voluntary sector, which they do a fantastic job, it is sporadic. It is different in different parts of the country. The funding is different in different parts. The accessibility is different in different parts of the country. So we said take a wider look at that. For example, some Section 39 organisations, it has been addressed with recent pay agreements, but they really struggle to get people and keep people because there's better pay rates somewhere else. Uh, but also they struggle because they, they don't know their annual, they only know their annual funding. They don't get multi-annual funding. So they can't plan for resourcing or can't plan for services. They know what they'll get next year, probably a couple of months into the year. So, you know, some very real practical things we believe can be implemented in our recommendations. Just one more question for me, Chair. Have you looked at any kind of a programme specifically for the school sector, for the primary school sector, to try and a, a constant year on year driving a programme of education to kids at that age when, you know, when they're quite young, they're not going to be offered drugs. I'm talking about, you know, five, six, seven, eight. And at that time to try and give them the awareness and understanding of exactly what you know, potentially is facing them in the future if they, you know, if they dabble, if they get addicted. That's what we're all afraid of. Yeah. And, and we do have recommendations around all levels of education, primary, secondary, etc., uh, for greater awareness. And we had a good debate actually whether such programmes are better delivered by people who've had lived experience or such programmes are better delivered by teachers. But we believe bringing people in with lived experience. We should say though, you know, that's not a silver bullet. If you do come from an area you know, that has a high social deprivation. If you have suffered early life trauma, if you have, you know, parents at home that are self-injecting, it's a different solution, you know, it's not just how you teach people about it. So we do believe there's recommendation in there. I wouldn't, rec I wouldn't say it's a silver bullet to, you know, solve it, but it's important. Deputy Shannon, might I just quickly add something there? I think you're on all fours with what we were trying to do at the Assembly when you mentioned about the, the Ivy League and it's a pan-societal issue, and some people would say that's why we're talking about it now, because it's affecting every strata of society. It's not just the marginalised areas anymore. And now everyone all of a sudden stands up and wants, <coughs> wants to tackle this issue. Um, you mentioned that uh, cannabis and the potency increasing, and you refer to the fact that some people think it's a soft drug. And it's exactly that type of behavioural norm we're trying to get away from. There's no such thing as a soft drug. Every drug is harmful because it's harming the people further down the ladder. They're, they need suppliers. There's seven-year-olds being groomed from the age of seven to deal with uh, supplying for these criminal gangs that have absolutely no regard for life. So they're all interconnected. There's no such thing as a soft drug. There's no such thing as a drug user who doesn't have a harmful effect somewhere else in society. And as soon as we start to realise that we're all interconnected and part of this issue, we're not going to resolve it. I'm sure there'll be a point to come back in. Um, Senator Sherlock. Yes, yeah. Chair, and look to, to all here today and, and to the, 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 the wider um, Citizens' Assembly, um, I think we owe you all a huge debt of gratitude um, in, in terms of the work and the concise set of recommendations that we have before us. I think 250 hours of roundtable conversation discussions is, 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 is an enormous commitment. Um, so so I, want, I want to thank you all very sincerely and also to Professor Ivers and, and, and Mr Galvin as well in terms of your, your professional work. It, 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 it's hugely valued in this area. I think we've got a profound set of recommendations here in terms of moving to a health-led approach uh, and it's very clear that we need a whole of government approach to this. You know, I, I heard what you said, Mr. Reid, in terms of the frustration uh, expressed by many citizen assembly members with regards to the, 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 the national drug strategy and the, the failure to implement some very modest proposals there. Um, you know, we all know here the reality is people don't wake up and have a problematic drug. Uh, problem in you know it doesn't happen overnight it happens because of, of of all the other issues in their lives and we owe it to the the two and three year olds in the sale project in Amian Street um, uh, to, to, to children right across many communities and and, and, and to the people that, that Ms Moynihan talks about uh, to, to, to ensure that us as a committee here actually actually uh, make progress on these recommendations I want to ask I suppose two specific questions firstly <coughs> recommendation seven 
And Mr. Reid, I want to ask you this question because obviously you, you have a very unique, uh, bring a very unique experience, I suppose, to the Citizens Assembly in terms of your own professional background as head of the HSE and then, of course, as chair of the Citizens Assembly. There's this, an explicit call to publish a draft national drug strategy by June 2024. Um, and it was a very bold call in some ways and a very welcome call. We hear what you say in terms of that there needs to be urgent action. You might give us some insight as to the thinking behind that, because I think that's an important deadline for us. We've heard what the Department of Health have had to say on the matter, but I'd like to hear your thinking on it, please. Yeah, I can actually recall the debate that we had on the day when we came to this recommendation and the, you know, there was a call from the floor we originally said, let's, you know, let's give it a year, actually. It might even be my advice, you know, to give time to, to do it. But the Assembly from the floor were very clear. No, this had to, we had to send a strong indication, the pace and the urgency of it. So mm. that's where it came and said at June 2024. Like yourself, Senator, I was extremely disappointed to read during the week uh, statements from the Department of Health that they will get to this in 2025. You know, they'll continue an evaluation and oversight and in 2025, it is when the National Drug Strategy expires, but we need a new one now, you know. So um, I, again, call very publicly, it's, it's not getting the pace, it's not getting the urgency, it's not getting the attention, it's not getting the focus. So we're losing time, we're losing focus, we're losing pace, but we're losing lives. So, you know, it is a real call. June 24 hasn't been achieved, but if it's going to be June 25, we're going to lose a lot more lives. Mm. Okay, well, I think that's a very important statement from yourself, so thank you. Can I ask about recommendation 17? Um, and I think the committee has very helpfully set out the questions for our committee here that we need to deal with in terms of that, that question with regards to decriminalisation. Can I ask the extent to which... Um, I, I, I suppose I, I want to understand whether it, it, the, the, the committee, the, the Citizens Assembly, thought that it was possible or not to actually go further than, like, is it ultimately the recommendation is that there should be a comprehensive health led re response to the possession of drugs for personal use? Um, I, I want to understand a little bit more about the conversation and the deliberations as to uh, the specifics in terms of, you know, the uh, sanction of prison sentences for those with, with, with you know, uh, found in possession, the number of times that somebody is found in possession, whether there was an attempt by the Citizens Assembly to, to go further than what we have in Recommendation 17 to actually give greater guidance to us here in the Oireachtas. Yeah, no, great question, Senator. Two things. Firstly, we gave the Assembly members five options uh, on a range of continuum from the status quo uh, to the held out approach that's on the department shelves since 2017 to what we had, which was recommended comprehensive health led to more liberalisation to legalisation. So they had five options and each of them we would have worked through. Mm. Secondly, uh, there was a very interesting moment for all of us, I think, in the Assembly uh, when we had a senior presenter from the European uh, Centre for Monitoring Drugs and Drug Addiction. Um, and they kind of said to us, they gave an example of what's happening in legislation and decriminalisation all across other countries. And they kind of said to us, be very, just try articulate what you want to achieve. Uh, you may not have the knowledge and the legal expertise to describe it and legalise it and everything else. And even when we had lawyers in, they differed about what legalisation meant, what decriminalisation meant. So they gave us very strong advice. Just set out what you want to achieve. And we refocused ourselves and said, right, we don't want people to get a criminal conviction for personal use. We want people to get supports of diversion and dissuasion. Uh, and we want them decriminalised. So we, 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 we kind of articulated as that. What we left open, you're quite rightly, were the more co some complex issues, which I believe the Oireachtas and government you know, can get the right legal advice on. And uh, they are the issues of, you know, what's the limitations? What's for personal use? What is it? Uh, how many times would you be caught before, you know, you stop being ruled through a health led system? Um, the issue of, you know, can our current legislation be, does it need change legislation in terms of if you want to, you know, if you want to decriminalise uh, some things like that? So as you're, you're quite rightly, and who would apply the sanctions? Uh, currently it's a court, it's a justice system. Uh, who would apply sanctions in the future? Uh, to help you through a health-led approach. Uh, and if you're not going through a health-led approach, who apply? So there are questions that we believe from the Attorney General and others to get the right legal complex advice. So we stuck to what we wanted to achieve as an outcome. Okay, okay. And just final question. Um, 
In terms of the uh, participation of Angarda Siakana um, in, in this assembly, like we have seen over the last number of years now, between 2019 and 2023, I think a 54% increase in the number of people charged for personal possession in the Dublin region. I think it's 74% in the Eastern region. I think Mark Ward or Gina Kenny is here, so I think it was his parliamentary questions that 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 that, that uncovered this. C can you give us some insight as to where you think uh, Angarda Siakana? their perspective is with regards to decriminalisation or in terms of going after those in possession um, of uh, drugs for personal use? Because I think this is a, obviously a, a, you know, a huge concern for us in terms of uh, trying to change the, 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 the approach from a criminal justice-led system to a, a health-led system. So I'd like you to hear your to thoughts. First of all, we recognise that the Guard put their lives at risk every day in terms of fighting crime. Secondly, they contributed really well to the debate. Thirdly, they were consistent in their views mm. uh, that they didn't want legalisation. Mm. We did probe further where did I lie in the spectrum of decriminalisation. I shared a platform yesterday again with the Assistant Commissioner Justin uh, Kelly, and you know, I'm, I'm not certain where they stand on it. They were certainly against legalisation. Um, but you know, the Assembly did get frustrated at times, and I, I said it publicly that you know, we just perceived it as the status quo was fine. Let's let's keep that. And our strong view was no, the status quo isn't fine. So I couldn't I won't answer from Garda Sheikh on where they stand now, uh, but they certainly were against legalisation. I'm not fully clear clear where they are in decriminalisation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, and if I can move on now to Deputy Gold. Yeah, first of all I want to thank you for the a great piece of work, a very complicated um, piece of work, and to everyone who was involved in uh, the Citizens' Assembly. Um, personally, I, I think um, sometimes Citizens' Assembly can be used to tackle really care, compl complex questions and maybe give uh, governments uh, cover then when they need to deal with them. Um, so your recommendations, your 36 recommendations, and the job of work we have to do now to bring out a report in the next seven months. Um, I suppose just to, just to, for me to get to, to, to a few points, um, in relation, I certainly believe that this government and previous governments have had no interest in tackling, uh, developing a, a drug strategy that actually would work. You referenced that yourselves in relation to the health-led approach that was never um, uh, that was never acted upon. Uh, when we look at what happened with austerity after the financial crash of 2007 and 8, and the absolutely destruction and um, slashing cuts to uh, task forces, to community services, um, education, most of these, most of that funding hasn't been returned. So here we are now, um, 17 years after the financial crash, a lot of these services are operating with similar type money, um, no multi-annual funding, not able to plan how they're going to deliver services. And to me, um, if we are going to get a drug, a drug strategy um, right, the first thing that must happen is there must be resources, <coughs> staffing and money put in the community services, the HSC, uh, detox beds, residential beds. Like we have a situation now where we had Keltoy, which was seen as one of the a, a brilliant facility that engaged with people both in recovery and mental health. And um, what should have been um, ruled out nationally uh, was closed, has been closed for, for years now at this stage. So the frustrating point, for, frustrating thing for me is, as the Sinn Féin spokesperson for the addiction, recovery and wellbeing, is that the government, I don't believe, are serious in uh, developing a drug strategy that actually would work. Because if they were, the first place they would start would be in communities, would be um, funding these uh, services. And also then you, you referenced the fact in relation to some communities that are disadvantaged. Um, sometimes I hate using that word because of a, a stigma and I try to put a whole community into a box to say you're disadvantaged. I come from Lachlanheny in Cork, which is one of the areas under regeneration. I never considered myself disadvantaged. Now don't get me wrong, we have a lot of challenges. 
uh, and we've seen, a lot, we've seen a lot of the consequences uh, of the harmful, devastating effects of drugs. But like, I, we know people all over Cork and all over this country who came from affluent families as well, who see those same devastations. But it certainly is right to say that areas that have suffered deprivation and disadvantage and a lack of services and a lack of funding are way more affected by drugs and the consequences. Like, uh, the community I represent, um, I, uh, without being uh, too thrown away, a comment. Like, I, I'm involved with Savings Hall and Football Club, I'm involved with coaching teams all my life, involved with schools coaching. I can tell you, I can, as soon as a child joins our club, right, or any club, you look at the family, you look at the, uh, the, the, their personal circumstances, and you know that child is going to be gone by 12 or 13 or 14, you know, the vast majority. Um, and what I could never figure out is why the government, like, we have really good schools, we have really good um, HSE, we have really good part of education, how there wasn't um, a link to identify children at risk. And you see, what I've seen when we're dealing with Tusla is we're only dealing with the children that are extre at extreme risk where we identify children who are at risk that if we get them into pathways of sport and education, and like, just looking at some of your recommendations there you now about number 25, focus on community responses to drugs, uh, 27, focus on prevention, uh, number 29, uh, commu uh, communication about reducing uh, stigma. Like, these are, all, these are all things that should be here now, you know? Um, and I, I suppose there's so much I want to say about this. There's so much good in your report. Like, in actual some ways, is I don't, I don't really see the need that she had to do this because this go the government and previous governments should have done this. Surely the expertise was there in the um, HSE and the Department of Education and the Department of Justice to look at all these things. So I, I probably have to rambling. It's just that I really uh, care about this subject and I really appreciate the work you have to do. And then uh, if you wanted to make one comment on that, I know my time is limited. Uh, we wouldn't disagree with much of what you said. So you, very clearly, just your earlier point around, you know, what, what needs to change in terms of strategy. We have a number of recommendations in there. But we, we really talk about making it clearer responsibilities, clearer accountability, who's responsible for delivering what across the spectrum of services, that we should be producing an annual action plan about how we're performing against the strategy, measuring our really good KPIs on it. We should be involving stronger um, people with lived experiences and, and community voluntary groups who are involved in developing the strategy, we should be doing it. So we have a number, of, you know, we should be looking at the issue of dual, di dual diagnosis. It's not just in many cases, it is an issue of dual diagnosis and mental health issues, so they're not simple problems. But we were very specific on them. We, we outlined some which you know hasn't been debated so far, but just the whole criminal, uh, the criminal justice system, but the criminal system in terms of prisons. You know, as again, I was at a presentation yesterday. I think there's 4,900 people in prison now. Almost 70% of people have some form of addiction. There are no specific services in the prison, and, and with the help of. Uh, uh, the chair has spent some time in, in Mount Joy dealing with uh, some long-term prisoners and some of the issues with the prison service have to deal with. And there's just, and it's in our report again, a complete lack of comprehensive or any services in many cases uh, to support the prison service and the prison system as well. So we're very clear, we're very specific on the strategy, but don't you say develop a new one? We have some very clear recommendations as to what should be in it. Yeah. Deputy Goldmite, I just um, make one suggestion about that. Um, you mentioned a few things. One of them was this idea that it seems to predominantly affect these marginalised um, communities. And we talked a lot about social capital and the idea that you'd have uh, the supports around you, community, family, kinship, care, all of that that we have in certain sectors of society that just doesn't exist in others. And we do need to look at that. Um, the, the details are in the report. The other issue I would just like to say is, I think um, Deputy Fitzpatrick mentioned how it's depressing in one way, because the enormous amount of human capital and human time and effort and money that the government is putting into this, but it's still not enough. And I think Brian is here, he deals with data. It's about evidence-based solutions. What is working? 
Can we roll it out? It shouldn't be patchwork across the country. Everyone should be entitled to this type of care. And the sooner we pull together and get that done, the better. Thank you. Um, I would like to just acknowledge that Senator O'Hara and Senator Siri Kearney are online and listening in, but they won't be able to contribute just given their location. Um, but I would like to invite um, Deputy Kenny, who's um, visiting the committee, um, but I'll, I'll come in after Deputy Kenny, so you can go before thanks, me. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, everybody, for coming today and on your excellent work uh, on the Citizen Assembly. Um, and it, I think it's, it's been a forthright debate, a healthy debate, and a debate that has, needs to happen uh, for a considerable amount of time. And I think we would all agree that we've had six decades of legislation that has been, that hasn't worked, you know. It has criminalised whole swathes of communities. It has left in its wake uh, a trail of a failure. Because if anybody in this room can say we've had six decades of the misuse of uh, drugs legislation that has actually worked, well, I'd like to hear their response. Because what ha that has done, it has criminalised people, it has put people in the kind of prison complex, it has emboldened <coughs> and enriched a tiny amount of people in society that has done extremely well out of the drugs industry. Drugs are going to be used whether we like it or not. You know, there's drug use, there's drug abuse, there's all sorts and everything in between. Uh, my question is in terms of the interpretation of what we talk about, a head-led approach and decriminalisation. Uh, my kind of instinct is that there's different interpretations of what decriminalisation looks like in an Irish context. Because it, from my reading of this situation, uh, uh, certain sections of the government, certain sections of civil society, certain sections of uh, the police uh, actually want the status quo to to keep on, right? And they're actually, they want to even go further than that. They actually want to go backwards. That's certain sections of uh, them three bodies. So in order, I think, to have decriminalisation to work, you've got to look at the Misuse of Drugs Act in order to start changing things. Because if you don't change that, it's very arbitrary in terms of uh, how decriminalisation uh, is, how, how, how it works, and how actually it can benefit society. I think decriminalisation is a good model, but I think we need to go further than decriminalisation. Because the, the elephant in the room about decriminalisation is that the black market still exists. We still have the control of drugs, which is the irony at the end of the day. We have controlled drugs that are not controlled by the government or the state, they're controlled by criminal gangs. And once you have that situation in place, uh, you will have uh, what we have had in the last six decades. So just in terms of, do you think the establishment of them three bodies I've talked about, do they actually have the stomach to actually go further than just a lip service around health out, a health out approach, but actually, um, actually uh, implement decriminalisation, even on the Portuguese model, which is even limitations on that? I think that'd be the moment now. <coughs> Uh, amongst all statutory bodies uh, for to adopt the change that we're recommending and whatever change is recommended from yourselves. I think this is the moment. You can't wait for another um, few years uh, to make decisions on it. I think just a few things. We're very clear and the status quo was looked as an option. It was ruled out by the Assembly. We looked at the current health-led approach that was in the 2017 strategy. It was ruled out as an option. So we went further and we believe that it needs legislation to decriminalise. So that's the different approach that we reckon, based on even the current strategy. Uh, so we believe that it needed legislation to decriminalise it. We did leave open, and I was talking with Senator Sherlock earlier on, we did leave open, not open, but a view is that obviously the committee will consider about um, what that legislation to do, what legislation has to be tackled, how many times, um, issues around a prison sentence does not need to be introduced a prison sentence for drugs, if that needs to be, how, how, how that can be eliminated, and a few other questions. But our view, like I said, that, uh, Deputy Sherlock was absolutely clear, decriminalising, let's get us out of this vicious cycle. Where the appetite is for the other statutory bodies, my own sense, it's under test now. Um, you know, if we're really serious about it, we shouldn't be talking about 2025. I, I don't, Paul, I don't think they have the appetite for it, I'll be honest with you. I really, I mean, look at the work that you have done is excellent. And I think there is a new change in the public and even in here, right? But there's, I just don't sense there's an appetite in terms of 
certain sections of the government. They just want the status quo to exist, you know? That's, I, ho I hope I'm wrong. I really, really hope I'm wrong. Well, it, certainly under test. It's under test now. Um, yeah, that's, oh, and that's okay. Good. And certainly the presentations we had, that's all I can go on. At the assembly, it was there was a range from let's hold to where we are now, things are okay, to no, actually, and even from statutory bodies in particular, uh, to know we have to do something completely different. We're not addressing the fundamental issues. So um, there was a range of views from statutory bodies, including Guards Chacon, including HSE, including the Department of Justice, including the Department of Health, from one end of the continuum, let's just tweak what we have, to where our view was, no, let's take, let's leapfrog two steps further. Thank you. Um, if I might say, just from like a, a member's point of view, I think all uh, mentioned it there. There was a, a wide range <coughs> of presentations that dealt with issues of, as you said, the status quo right the way through to to legalisation. And I think the the big takeaway was that at the end of the day, we we wanted to step away from the status quo. So certainly, the members. Um, don't want it to remain the same way because we had those presentations and decided we don't. It's a, it's not dealt with the issue uh, very much, like you said in your, your statement there. You know, it's been this way for however long and clearly isn't working. And it was something that the members were definitely um, agreed upon is that it can't remain the same way. Graham, as would you is. agree that status quo has been a policy? You know, by the by successful governments, and they're happy enough with the status quo. You know. I, I don't know if they're if they're happy enough, but I think certainly the fact that the citizens' assembly has been set up is a recognition from from the government that the, this issue is not being dealt with appropriately, or else kind of we wouldn't have have been been sitting here. Um, and I think it was, you know, throughout the the number of discussions, it, there is no kind of from my my personal interpretation anyway. There's definitely no silver bullet that's going to deal with the issue. I don't think you can maybe say. You know, decriminalisation is going to solve the issue. There's, there's so there's the 30, 36 recommendations there, with, which deal with both education, funding, and I think, as as recommended, the health-led approach is just one kind of, you know, arrow in our quiver to to deal with the with the issue. So um, that was certainly from a member's point of view how how I felt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I might just move on if you can. Um, so thank you very much. I think we will go into a, a, a second round, but I might just ask a few questions um, before we do. I suppose um, there's, there's lots of conversations there, and I think for my contribution, I think I'd rather just focus in on recommendation number 17. And I think um, e when you look at the caveats, I suppose, in relation to the Citizens' Assembly and what they laid out, it's like really understanding, I suppose, the Citizens' Assembly idea of what decriminalisation actually is. Um, and whether justice has a role in decriminalisation, because if it's decriminalised, justice doesn't have a role at all. You know, so even if we look at whether we're looking at that administrative um, piece, because the kind of block seems to be, well, we can't do administrative sentences. And it's like, well, why are we saying that we're even looking for administrative offences in terms of actually completely removing possession in relation to any sort of uh, diversion, because not everyone needs a diversion. There's plenty of people within the walls of power here that use drugs that will never need uh, a diversion. Uh, that's a huge amount of resource and money to send every single person who is stopped and has a substance in their pocket, uh, assuming that they need supports and help. Um, obviously, addiction affects a minority of people who use drugs. So the minority of people who use drugs is where the recommendations for me, the rest of the recommendations for me come in in relation to those social determinants, poverty, trauma, all of those, so that people don't use drugs in a way that's chaotic and is accumulative across whole, whole communities. So what I would like to really understand maybe um, from, uh, from yourself, uh, Paul, is in relation to what you understand decriminalisation to be, what you feel the members understood decriminalisation to be, forgetting for a moment the idea that there may be some questions around, there's any sort of constitutionality questions or any sort of guard of powers questions around stop and search, but what does true decriminalisation look like? Because prohibition hasn't worked, that is the evidence. And also decriminalisation of the user, decriminalisation of addiction, um, 
doesn't also reduce drug use. And I think some people maybe think that we're going to reduce drugs in the country or drug use because of decriminalisation, but really what we're going to do is not compound the harm and give people a way out. So I'm wondering from user perspective, and obviously it's up to the Oireachtas to legislate on this, but what is decriminalisation from your, uh, your perspective and the members' perspective? We were clear that, and it's described in our report and our statements, it's a paradigm shift, right, to take it out of a criminal system and put it into a health system and a health aid. It's not a hybrid. We're not saying a bit of both. Yeah. Uh, we're saying a fundamental shift out of a criminal system and into a health aid approach. To substantiate that or to make that work, there are supports needed in terms of dissuasion and diversion. Quite rightly, not everybody needs to be, somebody might not have a problem, they don't have to be diverted off somewhere else. But we are very clear it's a paradigm shift out of a route to market, currently that's a criminal system, to a health system. And take the stigma, take stigmatisation out of it. You're being dealt with in a very fundamental, different way. Does that involve a guard still stopping and searching you, finding you in possession, and him deciding whether you need diversion or not diversion? So the whole threat of stop and search is a criminal criminalisation back a step because it still involves policing. So does, should you only be stopped and searched if you are, I suppose, there's suspicion around whether you are selling drugs or whether you are involved in sale and supply? You know, so a, a person who's on the street who may have heroin in their pocket is quite yeah. clearly in and out of merchant's key is not a drug, you know what I mean? So there's all those differentiations. So where do the, poli the police force come in at all and should they only actually be involved if there's suspicion around criminal activity? And if possession of a drug is not a criminal activity, why should stop and search exist for something that's not a criminal activity? May, may I come in just, Deputy, because it, our Senator, it's, it's a very, obviously, complicated set of questions, and we've done up a... The report itself has quite a lot of detail about what the Citizens' Assembly meant by a comprehensive health care approach, and then we've sent in a, a sort of supplementary paper last evening as well, which hopefully mm. will give you a much better understanding, A, of the confusing different ways that decriminalisation can be explained and meant, because very different meanings can be attributed with the same term. So it's a highly problematic word. Um, so what the Assembly did, instead of trying to define decriminalisation, they defined the policy objectives that they want. And the objectives that they want is a combination of a version of decriminalisation that supports health diversion and it supports dissuasion. So the two points of reference that they that you can equate their model to is Austria and Portugal. Both of them have health, comprehensive health-led approaches. Um, and in both cases, there is a role for authorities other than the health services as the first point of contact. And that includes the police, both in Portugal and in Austria. The police, because the um, version of the decriminalisation in use in those countries, and this is the version recommended by the Citizens' Assemblies, possession of drug use continues to be an offence it continues to be illegal and prohibited under law. And so the per first point of engagement, whether that be the police or other authorities that find a person in possession, they have a legal mandate then to refer that person to the health-led mm. intervention. Um, and that, in theory, should be the end of the police involvement or the end of the, author uh, the authorities' involvement, other than in the case where somebody then doesn't cooperate with the, if you like, the dissuasion sanctions imposed for example, by the dissuasion committees in Portugal or by the health authorities in Austria, they will then potentially run the risk of, of committing an offence. So in Portugal, there's an offence called disobedience of... And, you know, so, so, it's, so, that, it's, so there's the issue, mm -hmm, though, even in mm -hmm. the old understandings from Portugal, which yes. is 20 years old, which they would see that their decriminalisation model now is completely outdated. Because when we look at the fact then that there would be even later sanctions mm -hmm. where addiction doesn't work that way, so it's still criminalising addiction, but actually decriminalising personal mm -hmm. drug use. Because if you're a recreational mm -hmm. drug user, the likelihood of you actually not fulfilling out the sanction mm -hmm. or being stopped and searched again and again because you're not from an over-pleased community, mm -hmm. you still have a system then where if you're in addiction, yeah. you, it could take 10 years for you to find any sort of abstinence or recovery and you could be stopped and searched and stopped and searched and stopped and searched and not be able I to take keep up your appointments. Sorry, sorry, and also, I, yeah. But also, 
in relation to the current system that exists, the, the 2017 proposal mm. that the department are saying that they're running out an adult caution, would mm. you also see that as not being decriminalisation, that that's also just, we're going to temporarily say it's a health issue and then we're going to say it's not a health issue, it's a criminal issue? I suppose maybe the starting point here is that there's two very distinct versions of decriminalisation. One is the 100% decriminalisation, which we heard from legal experts at the Citizens' Assembly explaining is tantamount to or equivalent to legalising possession. Okay, so there would be no role in that situation for any Within authorities... Within limits. Pardon? Within limits. There'd still be limits set on well, the amount. Well, so anything that would be... The limit would be personal possession. So obviously if somebody is found with drugs in their possession that is above and beyond... Beyond the limit, ...personal yeah. possession, that would be an offence under yeah. the supply and distribution legislation. But there is a version of decriminalisation that is equivalent to legalisation. And that version is something that the Citizens' Assembly voted against. So what they voted for instead was a health-led approach, a comprehensive health-led approach, which isn't legalisation. The, the, uh, there is still an offence. Now, the nature of that offence has to be defined, but there is an offence under law, so possession of drugs would remain illegal and would remain prohibited. It's just that the way it's dealt with by the state changes, as Paul said, from a criminal justice-led approach to a health intervention-led approach. But is it, though? If it's, it's still criminal justice-led because it still allows people to be stopped and searched and stopped and searched. So the nature of diversion is that it requires a legal basis for people to be diverted into so the health So it's criminal, services. it's actually then still criminal justice led with a potential yeah. health outcome. So if you, want, if you unpack the concept of decriminalisation, what are you looking for? You're looking to arguably reduce down the prospects or eliminate the prospects of somebody receiving, uh, being prosecuted and being convicted and receiving a custodial sentence. So that's, if you like, unbundling the concept of decriminalisation. Now, there is also, so the version here is supporting diversion and dissuasion as well as decriminalisation and that's the detail in recommendation 17 is that's what the assembly recommended rather than a version that achieves legalising of the possession okay Chair, thank you there, we had two lawyers um, with two contrary views about what was decriminalisation and what was legalisation and mm. they both differed mm. one gave a view called just sort of and another said no 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 if you decriminalise that's that's fully legal we were very clear, we just want to take it out of the criminal justice system. We, we weren't, yeah. Yeah, we were unambiguous about it. Yeah. But then that's out. saying two different things, because if we want to take it out of the criminal justice system, then we also want to take it out of the policing. We can't, we can't uncouple policing on the street of people with possession of the drugs from the criminal justice system. No, and, and Chair, you, you could look at other, other of our recommendations, which did address the whole issue of stigma. If you stay, take stop and search, yeah. you, that's... That, Hugely, it's the stigma of a very public uh, stop exactly. and search. You know. But to be frank, there's, we did, as in the summary note as well, you know, summarise those outstanding issues yes. that the Oireachtas will need to decide on. Uh, that will bring further clarity to it yes. than we felt we could at that point. OK, I've gone way over time, so apologies for that. If I can just go to Deputy Stanton. Thank you. Apologies for having to leave a parliamentary four, question. No, six. And then four. Sorry, so six. So Deputy Sandon hasn't come in yet, if so oh, six, thanks. and then we'll go to four. Apologies. No problem. Uh, apologies for having to leave. I had a parliamentary question to, to, to take in the doll, so um, um, an issue I've been chasing for a bit in there. So um, I was listening online as best I could as well to the debate, and uh, thank you for, for being here and for the work you've all done, as I've also said already. Um, just on the issue of, and I'm interested in this, just to continue on the conversation on the Portuguese model, and a number of years ago, we went out there. I was on the committee, and we went, we visited, and we spent a lot of time actually. Um, There's a number of years ago now, engaging with all the actors out there involved in that. Um, so, has there any, any analysis been done with respect to how effective their current system is? Could you speak to that at all? I mean, has, I've heard different reports that it's not effective at all. That. Um, that there are people on the streets that are actually really and truly in trouble with addiction. Um, and that the other one is that people are being offered drugs on the street. Now, I asked the police that when I was out there, and they said, well, did you buy some? And I said, no. And they said, well, if you had, you'd have bought something else. It wouldn't have been any illegal substance, because it's a scam thing that's going on, and they were very aware of it. But again, I don't know. So maybe you might just maybe speak to those points for a moment, please. Yeah, I think just been crying, some health research board, just to give some of the facts and data. Somewhere. Yeah, um, um, that's a very difficult question. 
does it work? Does criminalisation work? And I've spoken to colleagues in, um, in CCAD in, in um, um, Fairbest and Lisbon who've, um, who've looked at this for the last year or so. I think the basic principle is that decriminalisation on its own um, has very little impact. There's no point in, in, um, in changing the law unless you put the services in place. And Portugal were, were very um, keen, to, keen to do that. The other thing about Portugal is that it was they had a different uh, police system to our police system. We, we have um, a community policing model. It, we're coming through a, a, a post-authoritarian system, so people didn't didn't trust the police and so on. I think I think in the early days uh, there was. Um, it depends what indicator that you look at, but there was a decrease in deaths. There's no question about that. Uh, I think in the last five, six years, it's become you know a bit more problematic. And I, um, I think, as I, uh, as the chair alluded to, that they are having a closer look at their model, you know, and see how it can be improved. So it's. I think in in other parts of the world, um, I think Oregon, they they had a decriminalisation uh, approach, but didn't have. The kind of public health services that we have in Europe, so it just there was um, it it didn't achieve what it set out to to, to achieve. I, I don't I don't know if there is a direct link between the change the criminal status of drugs and the um, the availability of uh, of drugs on the street. Nobody has has, has really examined that. And of course, anybody um, um, who visits Lisbon can see uh, an open drug dealing. Seen how if that is connected to the change in the law in in in, in uh, I think uh, 2001, that hasn't been established yet. It's just it could be part of the culture. It could be just the the, the, the street life <laughs> culture of Lisbon as as an effect. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, again, I, I mean you talk about different metrics and the, the need for um, for services, and that was very evident when we visited a number of years back. That you, without the backup services and the follow-on services um, and treatment and help and support in that area, the, the whole, it, once, once, once somebody got into the dissuasion area and they were diverted, if the services weren't there, then you're in trouble. I mean, it's going over. So, have you actually carried out any analysis uh, or discussion on the, the amount of services that would be needed and the cost of services and the structure of services that we need here in order to, uh, if we went, if we went on the dissuasion model where people were actually encouraged to go for counselling or treatment or education, depending on the level of involvement, um, what, 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 what would that look like? Um, well, Deputy, the HSE was asked that several times during the, during the proceedings and the Department of Health, so they explained that they have a, an initial plan which only covers the, as Paul Reid said, the limited health diversion model that's being proposed and that limited plan would have one SER intervention worker within each uh, clinical health area, community health area. Um, but they were asked the question, well, then how would you cope with a more comprehensive health net approach where more people were being diverted into the service? And their answer was, well, look, we would just have to scale up according to the level of demand. So there is very limited capacity within the existing framework, but the HC would understand that uh, it would have to significantly scale up if there was a significant increase in demand, because the one thing you can't afford to have is sort of endless waiting lists just to access this SER brief intervention model. Okay. Sorry, I had much, much, much time earlier. Just, could you speak at the different levels of intervention there that you, that you mentioned? Sorry, the different could levels you... of intervention. I, I take it as education, as treatment, as counselling, as so on. What levels of intervention are we talking about here? So. Um, the 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 initial the current plan, which only relates to something less than what the Citizens Assembly refer to, provides for a, what's called a SARE brief intervention model. It's a motivational interview that is in some ways equivalent to what you would see in the dissuasion committees in Portugal, mm. but it's not as extensive. So it's focused on health interventions only. Uh, in Portugal, they also provide a wider range of services, mm. like a, a gate posting into, for example, employment and education and mm. training opportunities or social services. Uh, there's an element of that, but if the Citizens' Assembly recommendation for a comprehensive health-led approach was, was to be implemented, the existing model would have to be expanded to be a bit more robust. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Time is up, I think.
So I'm going to go back around for a second round of questions, which will be four minutes. There is a vote in the Shannon, though, so um, I do expect um, for uh, uh, Senator uh, Fitzpatrick to come back in. Um, so I'll skip ahead to uh, Deputy Ward. Thanks, Chair. I also want to talk about recommendation number 17, which is basically the decriminalisation of possession of drugs for personal use. And speaking to people in my community, family members, and even people in Leinster House, there seems to be a bit of fear and confusion about exactly what that is. Like, so, for example, the decriminalisation of personal drug use does not mean that a criminal act uh, carried out to obtain drugs is decriminalised. So there seems to be a little bit of fear in that. I think there's a bit of work that needs to be done on that. So any act that is a criminal act, irrespective of what it's carried out for, is still a criminal act. And I think that needs to be mm. got out to the public because that, that's some of the fear that's just coming back from already members of the community. We're even talking to people in here when they're asking, when it's the Citizens Assembly, that aren't on it, and they're asking me questions about that as well. So I think that needs to be put out there. There's also in relation to personal use in public spaces. And there's, that, this is another issue that was brought up to me as well in relation to a fear of increased antisocial behaviour, of, of maybe people hanging around as well. It's happening already, but it may be an increase in that, and that could lead to more fear and intimidation as well. So I was just wondering, was any of this discussed um, as part of the Citizens' Assembly's discussions? And I only, because I only have four minutes, I'm going to ask me a couple of other questions on um, Recommendation 17, if you can bear with me. Um, I had them. Technology is not always great. Also, in relation to, I know you asked those questions, but was... Well, and we have to come up with legislators, legislation, legislators on this in relation to a definition of what is personal use. Like, is it a monetary amount? Is it a weight? What is, what is uh, personal uh, use? And again, around that piece in public spaces, was, was that discussed as well? Thank you. Uh, Jerry, I just make a few comments again. They were discussed, they were debated, there were views expressed, uh, not in level of detail of, you know, what quantity might constitute personal use or, and how, how often you might be caught with personal use. Uh, but I will bring it back to the contribution that we heard, and it did shift our approach. Uh, we were trying to define to the nth degree as much as we could, uh, and the advice we were getting from lawyers was differing all the time. Yeah. It, was, it was confusing in the hall, to be frank. Uh, and I think the best advice we got at that moment, and it wasn't a cop-out, the best advice we got was, please just describe what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and we want to get people out of this criminal system. We want it to be done differently. We don't want them criminalised. How to execute that, to be frank, uh, we didn't have the expertise, we didn't have the time uh, to answer some of the specific questions you have uh, and what legislation might need to be changed uh, to come to that. But we are very clear, legislation is needed. Yeah. to have a decriminalised approach, not the current approach, a very shift. So, you know, to be frank, Push, we couldn't push, Pushing it back on, on ourselves, and basically, but, is what that is, for us to come to up with fair, definition think, on you, that. You are the legislators. Yeah, you absolutely, know, 100%. Yeah, yeah, we respect that role. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and we... Oh, he's looking for guidance. Yeah. Well, well look, mm. the, the best guidance, Chair, and, and the colleagues can comment, are very clear, not the current system. Shift two legs ahead of it. Decriminalise people. Stop the stigma that's going on. Right. Uh, and paradigm shift out from a criminal-led system to a health-led system. Get it out, not a hybrid. Okay. Sorry, Chair, uh, why don't we come in really quickly on that and just maybe give a bit of insight into the feeling around the room at the time. I think, and I'll try and keep it really brief, the basic understanding of, of it from myself, and I think I kind of may speak for some of the members as well, is that we don't want someone who's using drugs for personal use to be put in front of a judge or dealt with in that way. I think it was just the whole point is that we want them to be taken out of that that method because from the presentations that we received as well, it's it, it you know access to drugs doesn't stop because you go into a prison system or anything like that. So I think in in some instances in some presentations we we were led to believe that it's actually sometimes easier to obtain drugs and it doesn't help the addiction to be dealt with in that that criminal. Um, manner, so it was kind of that the whole point of take them out, out of that system of being put in front of a judge and kind of divert them to that health led approach. Thank you. Uh, if I could briefly yeah, add, if I could just ask maybe Johanna because she hasn't came on much and then maybe next time round. I think it's thank you, Chair. I think it's really worth clarifying that at the heart of the assembly was this notion not to have this lasting punishment of people that use drugs but also to recognise uh, that people who use drugs need support. And again, to bring it back to the evidence base, 
So they get diverted into this uh, brief intervention. And what we know about brief intervention, and it's an incredibly staunch hard science that's been tested in terms of its efficacy. So you can absolutely take it to the bank. So yes, I'm on the record as saying 90% of people will use drugs without consequence. Um, which means 10% or up to 15% in other jurisdictions might be addicted. Oh. What we know is there's another population that's kind of hidden, and that's anywhere up to 30% back that are using in a harmful or a hazardous way. And when we screen that population, two things happen. One, the high majority, up to 20% of them, will get the information, adapt their behaviour and uh, have the, I suppose, intervention they need to change it and the recovery capital to move on and all the rest. But there's 10% of those people that are at risk holding it together, and when they get a health intervention, they then need specialist care. So we are also talking about a hidden population. I think it's worth going on the record for that particularly when we're emphasising why this health-led approach, or, or more specifically, why are we making everybody go for um, a screening that they may not need? Point being, a lot of times people need stuff that either they're not willing to talk about, they haven't joined the dots, or they don't want to put themselves in a stigmatising position. So again, I think we're talking about hidden populations as well. So thank you for giving me the time, but I think it's important to note that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, now to Deputy Shanahan. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks to the guests. Uh, could I just go to uh, Joanna for a moment, please? Could you just speak about um, the kind of success rates that you see in terms of, of treating people with addiction, trying to get them through the system, the recovery rates, and any concerns you have about um, the rise of harder drugs, particularly the likes of you know, fentanyl, crystal meth, uh, which is already here, but the question where it's going. but. I suppose the work that you're doing and where you're positive about it or where you're maybe not so positive yet. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So I suppose just to go back and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Deputy Shanahan, um, and particularly, I suppose, to the point you talked about earlier on is where are we doing well? We, we save the current system uh, in terms of treatment and where the gains are is we favour people at the moment who have less complex needs. And they're the people who will be pushed through the system. So they're people who don't have a co-occurring mental health issue, have a house to go to, have positive relationships, most likely have a job or have had employment that they can pull on from the past, have education uh, either in small doses or the ability to go on to do that. So they have what we refer to as capital in their arsenal, you know, things that will help them sustain. And I think that what's happening is that we look at our treatment data and it's not for what the people on the ground are doing because they're doing tremendous work. But we have a system that is stacked against people who have complex needs. Um, and we really need to bookend the supports in terms of recovery capital and build that systemic capital that you alluded to earlier. And particularly in terms of this cross-government approach, we know in this country when we have political will, we get things done. When we have political will, we invest in, in things. We invest in people, we invest in communities. We, we put a plan in place, we put a timeline in place, and we make people responsible for that timeline. And ultimately, they're the ingredients of where we need to go. I know you haven't asked me what I would do, but um, in terms of what we're doing well, we're doing well for people with less complex needs um, and we really if we're going to look at this in terms of a societal shift we need to do better by people who are more vulnerable. Mm. Can I just ask you then yeah. in terms of, of the addictive nature of the harder drugs obviously it's going to be harder for people to get off the harder drugs and that's been seen uh, worldwide what, 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 where do you think we are in that in that graph at the moment in Ireland are we you know are we early stage have we even started kind of looking at this? I mean, I'll ask Brian about, about the exact data, but I can tell you this, we've never had more drugs available to us and we've never had more harder drugs um, in, you know, in our supply at the moment. But Brian can give you the hard facts around absolute data. Yeah, um, um, I think we've come a long way from uh, the early 90s and the, the 1990s and the, um, um, and the Rabbit Report. Uh, at that time, there was... No opportunity for, for anybody um, who's using heroin. Now we um, 
um, introduce the methadone program. We, we, we have needle exchange, we have <coughs> disease treatment, um, and, um, and, and we're going to open up a, a supervised injection facility. It's, we still have a high number of deaths, there's no question about that, but there is a lot been done to keep people well, keep people alive. The, we have um, uh, a way uh, of measuring the hidden population um, of opioid users, uh, it's mainly heroin. We looked at the last time we looked at it was uh, was 2019, and we're just updating it now. And it shows that the younger cohort, uh, 15 to 24, the, the numbers are are very small. The older the older cohorts, because they're living longer, it's as, it's as cold and brutal as that. You ha you have the same number of opioid users in the country, close to 20,000, as we had back in 2006. So that overall number is not changing. What is happening is that people um, have access to a lot more sophisticated services, um, um, a lot more opportunity to, to use drugs in a safe way. If, they, if, you, if you use needle exchange, it saves lives. If you, um, it, um, if you use naloxone, uh, it saves lives. Um, I think the supervised um, injecting facility it, it's going to save lives as well. So overall, there has been. I should acknowledge that, and not, and not use words like everything has failed because it hasn't. We we have achieved a lot. Now what we're seeing is um, uh, it was always um, opioid users who were the main problem uh, drug use going to treatment. That changed in the mid. Um, uh, the, the, the mid-teens, uh, it was cannabis was the most common. The, it was the most common drug for those coming to treatment for two to three years. That's been overtaken by cocaine. Um, I was talking to a colleague <coughs> yesterday, and, and she's looking at all the indicators of cocaine, and she said something mad happened in 2015 because everything is going up, up since then. Those coming to treatment uh, um, came um, in population studies where you can see that the, the, the Ice in Europe and deaths, <coughs> and, and cocaine deaths are, are um, a significant portion of the, the overall deaths. So it's an entirely new problem, um, and I, I, I think in some ways where we're, we're, people can be, <coughs> I think, fixed on the old model, of the, the old horror model, it's, it's, uh, it's shifting. Uh, and the fentanyl, if I could just have one, one, one last point on that. Thankfully, we've hardly seen any fentanyl here. I have to be careful not to mm. assume that the model of North America, which is um, astonishing, the numbers are just are just unbelievable. Last year in Europe, there were about 8,000 people died of overdoses uh, in the opioids. I think in America it was close to 20 times that. Uh, no complacency here because I think nitazines came last year, uh, created a, a lot of damage. But I think the response was quite, a, quite astonishing, uh, and lives were saved again. So mm -hmm. there is, we're in a much better position to have lives. I know recovery, you know, is a whole other, other issue that we have to um, have examine. But that hard um, um, crisis, the death, you know, is is um, we have achieved a lot, a lot to do. But yeah. Okay, thanks. Apologies. Uh, so I, I, I went quite over time there, but it was it was the most we'd heard from Brian, so it was uh, it was it was best to, to, to leave it go. So I because we're 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 kind of coming near we've probably about um, we've not long left, I suppose, to maybe make the way around. So I might have to just be a little bit tighter. So um, Deputy Stanton, do you want to come back in now? I'm interested in two areas. The area of um, recommendation twenty one you speak about family members and resourcing family members and um, extended support network and supporting people affected by drugs use. And then also, I'd be interested in the role of education in schools and in particular youth services this, in this space, the, 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 the actual kind of role they would have. Maybe if you could just comment on those, please. Very brief comments and colleagues on the, we had presentations from um, many family members impacted and they're sharing their experiences and they're quite powerful. Um, again, from all ranges of society in terms of the impacts and their capacity to get into the addiction services being, and the impact it has on the family, which 
you know, can be an awful carnage within the family itself. <coughs> uh, so I described that we had presentations from kinship care, uh, you know, putting families into care, supporting families in terms of caring for children. Uh, quite powerful presentations, and we just felt this is a kind of hidden issue that's probably not resourced or spoken about to the level of or funded. Uh, so there were good, again, good little islands of excellence of community groups, but not really on the radar from a wider statutory perspective. Um, yeah. Um, and just to add to that, th there was uh, one very specific issue, which was the level of financial support that kinship carers can be entitled to compared to what foster carers mm -hmm. are entitled to. And there was a call from uh, those involved in kinship caring to equalise that that difference because it would make a significant difference not just financially but also in terms of the access to psychological supports and other things that family members need. So that was one thing. And then, as Paul said, just the whole reality that in communities, both in urban and rural Ireland, there are family members that are getting together through um, family resource centres or through family uh, support networks to provide each other with support as they're going through, or as their loved ones are going through uh, addiction challenges. And that's something that we, uh, the Citizens' Assembly, felt could be significantly increased and strengthened. And then on the question of education, uh, there was a big focus of the Citizens' Assembly, a dedicated meeting really focused on prevention and the role of the education system. And one of the things that, um, that everybody, including the Gardaí, said was that policing your way out of the drugs problem is, is, is you cannot simply focus on policing. You have to focus on the upstream uh, question, which is how do you prevent people developing, starting to use drugs in the first instance, or if they are using drugs, stopping them becoming problematic drug users. And that's the whole area of prevention. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the Assembly members felt that Ireland is very weak at prevention. Um, we, we heard statistics, or we, we heard information that only a small fraction of secondary schools provide proper prevention education, and that only kicks in in transition year normally, and that's far too late for the, peop the young people in our, in our society. And so th at this stage, we have um, generations of adults who have never been exposed to any proper drug prevention information, and that is one of the root causes of why we're seeing such a, a rate of prevalence in society. So there was a call for a really significant increase in the preventative strategies, both for primary prevention, which is stopping people using drugs, but also secondary and tertiary prevention. The other question I had was the, the youth services and the link to gather diversion programs, with youth services in particular. I, mean, yes, yeah. I think they're, they're, my own view is that they have a huge role to play here. Yeah. It's informal education of yeah. the school. Yeah, no, absolutely, because uh, there is um, there's things that this can be done within the school system. We had a fantastic presentation from a young uh, uh, teenage girl from Clondalkin who had gone through a drug prevention program, which was partly done in school, but it was also partly done in the kind of youth work setting, and that was sort of driven or coordinated by the Community Drug and Alcohol Task Force. That was a really good um, example. Thank you. I'm going to have to, to move on. Sorry, Deputy Sandon. Um, Deputy Gould. Thank you. Uh, apologies, I had to step out there for a few minutes, but uh, I suppose just go back to your, to the comment you made there in relation to uh, the drug strategy, the new drug strategy not coming out till 2025. Like, is this just not a kick in the teeth to everyone who's um, who's involved with uh, drug treatment, uh, those involved with helping people in addiction and recovery, and even to the citizens' assembly? Mm -hmm that this is the type of attitude the department and the government, led by the government, has to uh, the drug issue. It is disappointing from our perspective. We, the Assembly, were clear from the floor that they felt waiting to 2025 wasn't good enough. Uh, they put it down as due in 2024. We knew that was a challenge, that being said. But it, it is extremely disappointing. Like, you do wonder, if some of these problems were happening in more affluent communities, would there be a different sense of urgency? Would there be a different sense of focus? But because of the harm is concentrated, very much concentrated, and I appreciate there's harm in every community, but the significant harm happens in those areas that struggle from a wider societal perspective. And you do wonder if it was happening in more affluent areas, would we have greater pace? Would we have greater speed? Would we have greater urgency in this issue? I think we would. So yeah, wait until 2025, we don't believe is the right approach. Yeah. A comment that was passed to me um, in relation to the 
I suppose the government's attitude towards it, and uh, first of all, I want to say I, any debt on the road is a tragedy, and we've seen an increase in road debts, and it's just loads of work needs to be done to try to bring those figures down for any families involved. This isn't meant to hurt them personally or... But when you look at the type of reaction the government is taking to road debts and the money it's putting in, and then you see, like, the amount of debts of people through overdose and drug use, like, is, there's no comparison, is there? Well, look, the, the evidence and the data is produced by Health Research Board, and we have the data, Brian mm -hmm. can talk in detail, but for 2020, there is 409 drug-induced deaths overall. Um, and we are complete, we're the highest, uh, worst performer across the EU countries. And in some cases, we're three times the level of EU deaths in other EU countries. And you can't get any more larger or impactful or urgent than that. You know, that's, that's an awful indicator for us to have. Yeah, and at this moment in time, and I actually raised it yesterday in the dial, um, I'm dealing with a lady who's at 12 months of recovery. And Cock County Council won't house her because when she was in the throes of addiction, and the reason she was in the throes of addiction is she was being abused by her partner at the time, uh, both physically, mentally. Um, she got away from him, got a better order, she gets out, she gets into recovery, she's a year into recovery now trying to get her two children back, but cannot get emergency accommodation because some local authorities, their attitude to people in recovery is a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. I was on the phone to this lady. I actually wrote to the chief executive of Cock County Council, the new chief executive, and I wrote to the acting uh, who was there before her. Uh, like, the attitude to people who are in addiction and in people in recovery she wants to have her two children back. She's a year on recovery. And when I spoke to her last week, uh, I, I was on text her this week, but when I spoke to her last week, she went through a very black phase a few weeks ago. And she, like, she's on an edge. If we can't get that woman accommodation, even temporary accommodation, uh, she could relapse. Uh, her children will stay in foster care, where if there was supports around even emergency accommodation, um, like, and what we do know is when people get into recovery, that the contributions they make to society, because of their lived experience, because of what they've gone through, it makes them much... Um, they're brilliant people, absolutely brilliant, their contribution to the state. And the, the one last point I'd make is, I, I brought out um, a charter of rights for people in recovery as part of my portfolio two years ago. And we, we met with loads of groups, uh, over 20 groups, we did focus groups, and what, I didn't put housing as the number one issue because um, it they say it's always should be it's always housing, right? But when we met with the focus groups, they said to us the number one issue for people in recovery is housing because if they can't get housing, they're put into um, centres where people are openly drinking, openly taking drugs, open, openly trying to sell drugs to, the, to them, and they are trying to fight. And, like, the whole issue of recovery as well, and I think you touched on it, is, like, more needs to be done my, to support people um, who will have to go through the battle of it. And, it, like, if you're in recovery, mm. that's a battle every day. Mm. I'm going to I defer it to the expert. Very, very because well, it's gone all the way over time yeah. there. Well, just, and I will be very brief, but I think this is an excellent example of where we have a system that's supposed to cooperate or coordinate. So you've got the Cork City Council that's supposed mm. to be a partner in a care plan, but actually it's up to them whether they play or not. And ultimately, if we shift towards that systemic model of building capital, we hold them responsible, and suddenly the policies that they make that directly affect people in recovery need to be, you know, monitored and evaluated and pushed back at them. Because currently the system we have is led by health and it, it, with the goodwill of our partners in housing and education may be coming to the table and may be doing something for us. But if we're serious about shifting and changing, we need those partners to row in with resource and policy that's going to directly affect the people who are in drug use, addiction and recovery, and yeah. ultimately build up prevention as well. Because, And can I just say, I'm, I'm going a little bit off script and I will be very quick. You know, we often talk about prevention being this off-the-shelf 
uh, package that we go into schools and we tell kids not to use drugs. Prevention is no different to recovery. It's about investing in communities so that people are dissuaded and they've got other opportunities so that they don't buy into drug use and they don't learn to cope with drugs and then they don't become addicted. So just, I mean, thank you for the time. Actually, I'm just to clarify, it was Cop County Council, yes. not Cop City, it's just... It's just <laughs> That's okay. No, just, no, just, 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 just to be clear. <laughs> yeah. Grand. Uh, thank you very much. Deputy Kenny. Thanks, thanks Lynn. Um, I just want to get back to the decriminalisation model in an Irish context, right? And I think we have to look to the past to look to the future. And I have, I think, uh, Maria Sherlock had uh, stated this... Um, PQ response that I got a number of months ago, and it's very, very revealing and very, very startling in, te in terms of the adult causing scheme to cannabis, right? So I'll read this out. From December 2020 to the 16th of February this year, uh, 5,139 people were issued with an adult caution for simple possession of cannabis or cannabis resin. When I asked the same question in terms of prosecutions, <coughs> get ready for this, in the same period, 17,500 people were prosecuted for the exact same thing. So the arbitrary nature of just leaving it to the discretion of the police, I think it doesn't work. It literally doesn't work. And that's my fear in terms of decriminalisation, in terms of in the Irish context. Because the establishment from Ryan and taken from their sound bites is that they don't want to go as far as changing legislation. They're very, very fearful, and they will leave it to the arbitrary nature of the adult causing scheme or something a bit kind of more broader than that. Look, I, I can't comment from Gary Shikhan, and I think I'll start for I presume. But the, no. um, sorry, but the, their response, I presume, was their response to the PQ, or was yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, okay. But the, um, again, I just, I'm not quoting verbatim, but Assistant Commissioner Justin Kelly was presenting yesterday. And he was making the point that um, many of the figures that you would quote for the 17,000 or odd would be for not just possession, they would be for other criminal activity that they, um, they, they were put forward for conviction on. But all I can go is on, on the presentations we had from the Garrett Chicana to the Assembly, uh, they were consistent in their view, uh, they were clear on both presentations, they did not want to move to a legalised model. We did push them, as Cherry pushed them, to what was their view on a decriminalised model. Um, I couldn't be very clear what it is or if they would prefer the status quo. I know Assistant Commissioner yesterday had said at the, um, the uh, presentations that they would be uh, in favour of a health-led approach, but I'm not I quite sure. the status quo. It does. Yeah. It well, does. Cer certainly at the, you know, I've been on the record, it's at the, at the, uh, at our citizens' assembly meetings, it certainly came across to us as the status quo was the yeah. preferred model. And I think they're happy enough with the status quo. I mean, I think there is elements of the guards that would actually be a bit more progressive in terms of the status quo. But I think there's a, at the top echelons of society, I think they're more than happy. And Paul, you have said it before, there's a huge class nature to all, you know, uh, this issue. Because if it was happening, the devastation what's happened, you know, it have it was happening in more affluent areas to be completely different response. You know, we all know that, so yeah. I think Miss Minahan wants to come Thank in you, there. Chair. And um, it just refers to Deputy Kenny's point and also brings in Chair Wan's point about the stop and search and the the stigmatization around that. I think around the round table discussions, members felt very strongly um, uncomfortable with that with the level of degree of stop and search that was going on in our city and across the nation. Um, I know the Garda Siakona did present to us that they were focusing on the supply, the chain of supply, but there was another statistic provided to us that the statistics in Dublin are the search and supply are higher than in London, which has nine million people. So there's, there's truth somewhere in between all of that. But I think it is to go to the chairs, there's stigmatization around the stop and search. It's criminalising a behaviour that we're trying to say is a health issue. And we do need to look at that. Um, so thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and I think just, just to come in on that, I mean, I don't think I've ever been shy about speaking about my own experience growing up and, 
as, as someone who was a child and stopped and searched many, many times on the walk to the shop. <laughs> and just because there was more than two or three of you together, you're assumed you're a gang. Um, and it's only in working class communities are you called a gang of youths, but in any other community, you're just a group of youths. <laughs> you know, so even the, the stigmatisation is, is well and truly inbuilt in how, in, in how um, policing happens. And um, the, the stop and search one is a really, I think, important one for us to grapple with over the next few weeks, I think, as we get into the crux of the committee. But what I want to ask is, as a kind of, um, I have two questions, but one is kind of a simple yes or no question. Um, and I mean, everyone can answer, or the mo most appropriate people, I suppose, I feel they would like to answer is, um, from some quarters, I suppose, of the department and government and uh, the DPU, et cetera, are waiving this idea that what they are currently doing is what the Citizens' Assembly has recommended in relation to recommendation number 17. So what I would like to ask is um, the, the, I suppose, what is de facto still criminalisation in terms of the adult caution scheme, um, when the government and when particular state bodies go out and say that what the Citizens' Assembly has already said is already in motion, would you be in agreement with that sentiment? Let's be very clear. We put to the Assembly members, are they supportive of the current model or even the model that was proposed as South Badge? It was rejected. Uh, and I would be very concerned if the model that we pr proposed was projected as what's in plan. It's not. It's a leapfrog ahead of that. OK, thank you. That's very clear. Would everybody else, I suppose, be in the same agreement with that? Yeah, I would definitely yeah. Echo, echo that point that it's, we, we go certainly further than what is what is being happening and any miscategorization that what we're recommending is what's what's there. occurring at the moment is completely yeah. incorrect. I appreciate that. I, Thank and you. Just to get very um, nerdy about it, the, the planned health diversion model applies for first, second or maybe third time offences, but after that... It, it goes back into the status quo, exactly. the criminal justice system, whereas the comprehensive health -led approach Doesn't. calls for either complete or extensive uh, opportunities for people to engage with the health -led system. So it's, it's a different order of magnitude. Thank you. And on like the likes of recommendations, say um, 12, 15, you know, there's, and there may be others where it speaks about the importance, I suppose, and then the, the, the effectiveness of stakeholder engagement in relation to whether it's people who use drugs, community, uh, community projects, families, I'm wondering, and, and community and community development has also been mentioned, and I think sometimes um, there's a, there's a <laughs> I think what some people understand to be community development within, uh, the, the, within departments is actually not actually what community development is in practice, um, and I think a lot of the recommendations in the report later on would really benefit from a community development approach, especially in relation to uh, service provision, in regards to social and cultural capital, in relation to recovery capital, all of those things. So I'm just wondering if um, anyone wants to speak to how they see that community engagement being carried out, but it's even going into that group that Johanna speaks about, that, that nearly um, unrecognised group or unreachable group or a group that's a little bit invisible, is that sometimes when we look at that community engagement piece, we're looking at um, community engagement that is already being brought closest to the state in terms of its um, you know, funding and its arms and, you know, um, and gatekeepers. In, in a sense of what actual real community engagement is and family engagement. So I just would love to know what people think about what real effective community engagement may look like in some of those recommendations. I think if we could do it over six meetings, over six weekends, and bring in the extent of community groups, family groups, lived experience groups, individuals, uh, over six weekends, over a short period, uh, over six months, this can be done, mm. you know, and, and can be done very quickly if we're talking about a five or six year strategy mm. and the kind of community groups we, we mean who are people who are on the ground rolling up the sleeves, practicing the supports, delivering the supports for the services. Sometimes, and look, I come from the previous role of Fingal County Council CEO and I meant to come back there and just say there are some, you know, housing force programs that have been successful for people in addiction. But, um, you know, there's ways to reach into the community. It's not the traditional headline groups that we might reach out to. Mm. Uh, if you look at some of those community volunteer groups we brought in, you know, this was their first outing. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think, I suppose, uh, yeah, I was going to ask if anyone else wants to come in for maybe a minute or two. We do have a little bit of time left. Yeah. Just a slightly nuanced uh, around that, Chair. Um, 
Is it a case that the, and Paul, I think this is what you're reflecting, but is it a case that the policing position regarding decriminalisation, uh, they would basically say that, listen, this is going to uh, normalise essentially drug use in society if it open the floodgates to potential, you know, kind of informal drug use right across society and, and you're not providing us, despite everything that the Assembly has done, you're not providing us the empirical evidence that tells us that that won't happen. And that if we take away this safeguard, you're not going to be able to re-implement it. That's, is that, would uh, you say, the police position? And to, to, do, to do justice, excuse the pun, to the, the policing position, they did say that. They did say their fears for a further liberalisation could result in Ireland becoming a, tr a tourism destination for drugs uh, and some of the controls that they need in terms of stop and search being reduced, they would have concerns. So, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but they did present that position at the very first Assembly meeting. But isn't it a case that we, you know, even just talking about what Portugal is doing and we know there's changes and happening out there and trends and that, that the policing position... That, whether you say there's merit or not to it, the fact is that they're saying you can't tell us otherwise, you can't prove to us otherwise. And maybe they're also aware that the ability of the state to fund all of the different sectors that are going to have to be funded to provide this purely health-led approach, and they probably have no confidence that money is going to be provided. But, but I think if you look at our, at our recommendations, so we did hear from Garda Shea Khan a position, and we heard all other positions, and we took a view, uh, which I believe is quite extensive, quite a comprehensive, and, and takes on all, the, all those views. And so we looked at it and we said, and if you look at our report, it's not all just about extra funding. There's certainly be an extra funding demand on the services from the diversion and dissuasion approach. Uh, but even in terms of some of the cross-government coordination of it, even in terms of some of the pace of introducing the legislation, even involving some of the community groups in terms of the design of sports, even in terms of the statutory and voluntary organisations having a different remit, even in terms of the courts systems in the current model, which is not what we recommend, but, but there's some good successes through that. So Thank you. there's many things we can do now. Very briefly, Cattle, and then over to Deputy Ward. And Thank if we can you, be Chair. brief. Yeah. I, I'll be really brief. It just, And I'm not speaking specifically about the, the viewpoint of the Gardaí, but there was a number of stakeholders in the room who you might expect would have... Um, would have concerns about legalisation, and the, and it, what was consistent about them was, and I'm including here medical representative associations and other and and others who were on the record as being against the legalisation. What they were all clear about is their, or, sorry, what a lot of them said was that they were concerned about a version of decriminalisation that was tantamount to legalisation, because that means one thing, and it sends out a, a very clear public signal about the state's approach to drugs, right? Whereas there's another form of decriminalisation, which isn't liberalising drug use, it's about changing the way the state responds. And there was a broad degree of consensus across most of the stakeholders who spoke, including those who were against legalisation, that simply criminalising a person for having a drug issue is not the solution, mm -hmm. and that there's scope within the way the state responds to change from the status quo to a more health-led response. So there is a large degree of consensus, um, and we saw that across the response of the political system when we published yeah. our findings, in support of a health-led approach. The design of that is one that's up, up for grabs, but as long as it's do it isn't interpreted that the Citizen Assembly has recommended something that liberalises or legalises drug use, that is recommending a different version of decriminalisation, which is a health-led response, then I think we'll find there is a considerable level of Thank support you. across society. Thank you. Deputy Ward. Thanks, Chair. I just want to pick up one point. If anybody thinks that Ireland is not already a tourist destination when it comes to drugs, hasn't been in Temple Bar over the last couple of months, <laughs> uh, or the last couple of years, you'd say, because, and, and this is this is part of the, the issue that we have. Like, alcohol is the biggest, most abused drug that we have in Ireland at the moment, but the stigma is not the same. And that's something that we have to break down as well when it, when it comes to this. And that's, that's for another day. Um, just in relation to, you mentioned, uh, Paul, in relation to multi-annual funding, I think that, that could be, for frontline drug services, I think that could be an absolute game-changer. Uh, for frontline services, because what's happening at the moment is that our drug services who are on the ground are, are getting to a situation where they're they're being uh, reactive rather than being proactive. They see things happening, they see changes in in, uh, in drug use emerging before we would say they see it. They're on the ground, they're on the front line, and they, and they can't change because in order for them to change um, their approach or to change to a different drug or whatever it might be or into a recovery uh, kind of model. 
they have to drop something else that's already the, what's already there, something that may be working well because they haven't got the ability to, to change because of the, the handcuffs around them in relation to multi-annual funding. I remember being in service, I think I booked one that came in after the one service where the, the, the manager was that focused on the funding that we used to close the service for a week just to get these forms filled out, which meant we weren't seeing any of the, any of the service users, any of the people that needed the service and they were left on their own. So I think we just really need to move away from that. So just in relation to the, the multi-annual funding and maybe put your hat on Paul in your previous role in the HSE, um, is the barriers within the HSE or do you think would the barriers would be in relation to government or how the government fund the HSE? I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm always asking about fun, uh, um, multi-annual funding and I'm just wondering where that is. Is it, is it government or is it HSE barrier? Not necessarily where I think if you go back all the way down the value chain. Ultimately, it's at the Department of Public Expenditure level and what's approved by government in terms of budgets. It is an annual basis. Yeah. But there, and I think there's a mood in in some kind of services to give a greater predictability on a multi-annual basis, whether it's capital or, or operational funding. So I think it would have to go back to an approach in terms of budgeting. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the HSE wouldn't have to remit to commit, or, or most bodies wouldn't have to com the ability to commit to multi-annual funding because they don't equally know order. So I think it goes all the way back up the value chain to how budgets are set, how yeah. the estimates are taken on board, and how. But like one practical thing that's coming up for the voluntary community voluntary organisations is it's just holding staff. You know, they, they, they don't know staff might have an annual contract or, and they yeah. don't know beyond that. Yeah. And, you know, in the current environment, that's really unstable. And these are great people in many cases, in yeah. most cases. Uh, Could you stand them? The current National Youth Justice Strategy. Now, it took us a full year of hard work and consultation to get it out there, and it's out there now, and it's being worked on. On the, what's your sense with respect to, you mentioned a few times about the um, drug, national drug strategy, and you've been, you've been critical of the fact that it's delayed and delayed and delayed, and you were saying the report here should be published this month, or at least the first iteration of it. And what's your sense of where it's at at the moment? Is, is it work being done on it? Is, how advanced is it? Have you any idea at all from your work in this area, from your feedback from it? Um, my understanding is the current one obviously was to expire in 2025. Uh, they are, from the Department of Health statement this week, they're taking on board the feedback from the National Drug Strategy, the committee and the oversight committee they have in place over the next six months. They're going to evaluate that, assess our report as well, and encompass all of that in the report to be published next year. That's as far as I am, you know, I hope I'm doing justice, what, but that was the statement this week. Yeah, I think we should write to the minister and get her an up to date, um, an up to date report on that straight away. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy. Um, Thank you. I'm going to go to Senator Mary Fitzpatrick, who wasn't here for our four minute round, so we might just restart the clock for the previous. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. Have to vote. Um, and I really apologise now if I'm asking you questions that were asked while I was out as well, but. Bear with me, please. I want to go back to um, this uh, recommendation 17. And uh, I heard very clearly what you said there, Paul, you know, in terms of the um, Citizens' Assembly and the advice you were given from the legal experts to just articulate what it is you want to achieve. Don't worry about the mechanics of legislating for this or, um, you know, operational implementation of it. Do you think this, and maybe yourselves actually, the, the members of the Citizens' Assembly and Paul, you, you could all answer this. Do you think the intention in its simplest form was to decriminalize the individual, decriminalize the user or the addict or the victim of drugs, as opposed to decriminalizing the substance? Mm. Yeah, and certainly our interpretation was we wanted the end outcome that the individual caught in possession for their own use is not rooted through a criminal justice system uh, and that was, that was the absolute outcome we wanted to achieve okay uh, and i'm sorry to be pedantic about it no, but it wasn't about decriminalizing the substance no from our perspective we said let's we were not saying you legalize drugs uh, or decriminalize drugs that it's still mm -hmm. but in the individual how they're treated is a paradigm shift out mm. of the court system mm. and through okay. a health-led approach. Okay, yourselves? Absolutely, I think Deputy Fitzpatrick, that... Um, Senator. Actually, I'm only a senator. Senator. Or only, I am a senator. I'm Don't sorry. you dare. <laughs> well, it's um, just my esteemed colleagues, you know. <laughs> 
that, I think you're absolutely accurate. I think it's a very good way of, of stating it. I think Graeme will probably agree. Um, the majority of members of the Citizens' Assembly believe that drugs are harmful and do not want them to be legalised. But they equally believe that the users of these drugs are, for want of a better word, victims. They don't like the word victims. I've met some of them. They're some of the most uh, resilient, as I think uh, Deputy Gold said, you know, that they really add a lot to society when they come through the other end. Really, um, we went out to visit Cool Mine uh, Drug Rehabilitation Centre, and I'd recommend every member to, to go out and, and really see the children um, that are not preschool children with their mums out there getting through rehabilitation. But yes, we don't want to stigmatise the people that are using drugs. We want them to be treated like alcohol abuse. It's a health issue, it's not a criminal issue. Thank you. Yeah, I suppose um, I would agree with the sentiment of, of, of both there in terms of, um, again, it's there, we kind of took the, certainly a personal sentiment is that they're people, they're not criminals. Um, for an individual who, who consumes drugs for personal use, they shouldn't be dealt with as a, as a criminal individual. Um, and, you know, we've went through and there's a plethora of reasons of why individuals might consume drugs and, and different levels, but at the end of the day, um, in its simplest form, is that they shouldn't be dealt with in a criminal justice context because they're people who use drugs. They're not okay. criminals. So, and that's what I thought it was, but I just appreciate you confirming that for me. So then you see, I think the challenge occurs for the Gardaí when, it, when, when dealing with this issue, and I appreciate this is only one recommendation, and there's an awful lot more, and all of them are equally, if not more important, but it's one that we're going to have to grapple with. So I just want to tease this one out in, in, in this section. The problem for the Garda is, is uh, as I see it, and, and I'd be interested to know what you felt from the Garda's contribution. They can't, they can't, uh, they're, they're not effectively policing drugs as all drugs, you know, all Ill illegal drugs, uh, even just let's say the most socially acceptable one, alcohol. They can't police that. We all accept that. Um, society polices it a bit because, you know, it's it, in some spaces not socially acceptable to be abusing it. But even that's borderline anymore, I think. We, we need to accept how out of control this whole thing has gotten. So I guess the issue <coughs> becomes then, <clears throat> how in God's name, if the substance itself was in any way legalised, would they operate? Do they give any insight, or do you, you have any insights from other jurisdictions on how that would operate? Maybe Cahill, yeah. Thanks, Senator. Um, and I, I think the question was asked earlier as well around, uh, you know, to what degree, um, for example, should policing have discretion, right? And the answer is in the two case studies we looked at in Austria and in Portugal, each of them have a, a different legal mechanism, but they're achieving the same objective. So the first point of contact in most cases uh, in Austria and Portugal is the police. They don't have discretion. They're required by law to refer the person to the health-led intervention. So it's not a case of they decide who gets referred and who gets referred alternatively into the court system. Everyone gets referred into the health system. Um, so the police don't have discretion, but they do have a role, and that role is... Um, is as that, if you like, that first point of call. Similarly, in Austria, for example, school principals and others also have a legal responsibility if they find somebody in possession of drugs to refer that person to the health-led intervention. So when you say they have a legal responsibility, is mm -hmm. that in a similar way to um, a principal or of a school would have an obligation from a child protection perspective? Correct. So it's that type of an, an, a legal obligation on yes. the individual. Yeah. And can you tell me how does that work in practice? Like, is it... The police person comes in contact with the individual there and then and refers them on and it's an electronic mm. referral or this drugs court that has been in pilot for 20 years mm. is it is there a similar type of court in place that no, they're referred it, it, to it and does the court mm. issues a direction i'd probably say that maybe the best comparator might be something like a guard who stops somebody for a, a motoring a, a road traffic offense yeah and the issue of fixed charge notice and the information gets conveyed on to the road safety authority mm. who then issues the penalty point and there is so there's a point of communication so there's the person is given a notice saying you're required to attend uh, 
a SER brief intervention or HSE service or whatever, and the service itself is also notified. And that's where the role begins and ends, rather than the guard pursuing, you know, adult cautions, for example, or um, referral for prosecution and into the courts. So the guard's role is simply first point of referral into the service. Yeah, and, and I think, I think just to say, yeah. it, it, it's a referral also, like the police don't have the power to, because it's not in a court system, so the police don't have the power to compel. make, compel somebody to go to, through a diversion. So again, like a road traffic offence, a person can opt instead to have a, you know, have their day in court if they don't want to accept the fixed charge notice and the penalty points. But just so to be clear, yeah. in, our, in our model, you would not be routed even through the current drugs court. That it's happens. Happening. It wouldn't be the route. Yeah. Even though that has benefits in the current scenario. Yeah. Would it, would be, it would be a, yeah. a, a referral from the guardee that would compel the individual to the referred service, referred service imaginary yeah. service that exists. And that sorry, one, exist. one differentiation which you used, a good example is often used of uh, alcohol. So alcohol is legalised, we're not saying that, but when it's, <coughs> when it's legalised it's then regulated, so it says who can buy it, where you can buy it, at what times you can buy it. So we haven't gone that route at all, you know, so we mm. haven't legalised. So we I'm just going to bring in Deputy Gould and then um, there'll be um, probably a question or two for myself and then th that, that, that's us yeah. done. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, apologies. Um, yeah, I suppose just touching on the policing and I suppose the attitude of senior management within the Gardaí. Um, like when you look at the lack of community guards, when you look at the lack of resources that the Gardaí have, like, do, is the reason why the Gardaí don't want to go uh, to change the status quo is because they know they don't have the resources to, to work a new system. At the moment, they have a system, you know, most people would acknowledge that system is broken. So why would you have the Gardaí, the senior manager of the Gardaí, uh, advocating a system that everyone, the majority of people, think doesn't work? And like, um, like, we, like I'm from Cork now, we walk around Cork, Dublin, Limerick, any of the big cities, right? Um, the Gardaí don't have the resources, and that all goes back to the, the austerity of the 2007. Templemore was closed, Gardaí was slashed. Now we're trying to, trying to get Gardaí numbers up, but they can't because of retirements and uh, people um, opting for different careers. So, like, if Gardaí management, I believe, don't have the resources, either staff or financially, to support a new model of policing when it comes to. Uh, if there was a new drug strategy. Uh, and that's why I think they're, they're slow to, to change. Also, just in relation to, um, like, I, 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 when, I, when we were talking, I was thinking of another incident. We need, and I said the whole government approach, but it might be a whole society approach, because I know a lady who was who refused for social housing with four children because she had a conviction for having cannabis for personal use. So the question then is, like, how can a person have a tiny amount of cannabis that would prevent her from being housed and her four children from being housed? Like, I think, uh, the, the, whether it's the HSC, whether it's the Department of Justice, whether it's the court system, whether it's the Gardaí, there has to be, the strategy would have to go right across all the systems. And I suppose maybe just in relation to, I know you, we, you spoke about the Gardaí already and how they want the status quo to stay. Like, why do you think that is? Just three, three points. Um, yeah, the, the... You know, again, to recognise, I'm sure you may, the committee may or may not decide to call on the Gardaí Connors, so I don't be speaking for the Guards, but you know, they do have an extremely, and we recognise that every every assembly meeting, the job they have, they're putting their lives on the line in terms of battling crime. So I just want to put that on record. Secondly, in terms of the demands that may or may not be on them with what we are recommending, we would probably have the view that there may be less demands. Mm. You'll have less yeah. days in court, you'll have less working through a criminal system, you'll have more people to do community policing. So, you know, there, there may be different ways of working, uh, approach with, but, you know, we wouldn't necessarily, not for Engarji Econa, see extra demands. We would see extra demands for health services and community services. And then, Finally, just on the uh, sorry, the strategy in terms of I think um, Johanna earlier on, Johanna Ivers, you know, answered that one about in the current model, 
uh, people can opt in to help, if you like, but it's not their accountability or responsibility to, to see solutions through, uh, the wider solutions, whether it's housing first or whatever the solution is. So that's why our strategy would say, bring this up to a very senior political level, a cabinet committee to oversee the responses. That, sorry, chaired by Taoiseach. So, you know, we see this ra raising up. And just to qualify that, one of the recommendations very clearly says place health in all policies. Yeah. Mm. And that's exactly what that refers to, making cross-sectoral government departments responsible. And just, again, a qualifying point, when I talk about cross-sectoral government departments, I am talking about a whole society approach because they're the departments that represent society. So it, it will absolutely mean that. And, and just yeah. the last point, each of the 31 local authorities have different definitions. Like, when people apply for social housing, if they've had a criminal record in mm. the previous five years, it can prevent them from being housed. But, like, that to me was always aimed at people who were involved in serious criminality, mm. right? Not for a person for not driving with no insurance or a person caught for maybe uh, um, shoplifting or maybe a person caught for um, having a, a, a cannabis for personal use. But what happens now is, that because each local authority has the ability to set their own rules, and to me, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we need to have universal, universality among the local authorities. And the thing about it is, for people who are in recovery, mm -hmm. every way they turn, there's a block. Where what we should have for people in recovery is every way they turn, there should be support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think um, I think everyone's in agreement, and I think that the housing issue is something that that will come up, especially I know in in the lights of the work that Johanna does in that, you know, recovery recovery capital piece. If you don't, if you can't access housing, you're already um, at a deficit there. Um, and also in relation to drugs possession, um, it's in the most serious category. No matter how simple the possession is, it's currently in the category with um, serious sexual crimes, murder firearms, um, so it's already captured in something that won't ever leave your record, um, even under the spent uh, convictions regime that currently exists. And I think hopefully as we go through the modules, we can look at all those other blocks in relation to people being able to um, safely seek, I, I suppose, um, whether it's abstinence or harm reduction models going forward. But I think I just want to kind of finish on maybe just one or two, two comments and, and, and one question. Um, it's, it's. I think sometimes I, I'm un a little bit uncomfortable sometimes when, 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 when it slips into the conversation about about the drug trade because in my work with people who've been involved in the drug trade, they are people who have come from the exact same vulnerable backgrounds. They've experienced the exact same poverty, abuse, and violence. Um, obviously, there's all different levels of that, but we need to remember that they're not too often too mutually exclusive uh, groups that sometimes say that, that they are the same group, um, but unfortunately, obviously, they're you know, in a situation where they may appear to now have some sort of like power or extra resource or whatever, but actually the, the underlying issues of the social determinants of dealing at a community level and upwards is often similar social determinants of those that who have ended up in, in, in drug addiction. So I think we also need to be careful, I think, about the language we use when we talk about those, because they are, they are within the community and the loved ones often of people who are on the other end who are, who, who are uh, uh, caught up in addiction. Um, and I think the, the idea of, I suppose, being victims of drugs, I think, gets me a little bit thinking around, well, you know, sometimes um, through my work, people would use drugs to survive, actually, because they've been victims of abuse, inequality, poverty, all of those things. And, and, and that sounds really hard sometimes for, I think, somebody, some people to understand that heroin kept somebody alive um, because it, it, it obviously dulled and numbed a part of them that they didn't have the capacity to be able to process in the real world, in real time, in terms of everything that was happening to them. And it's a bit counterintuitive, I think, to, to, to think that. So I think it is very... Uh, I, I am happy, I suppose, that we spoke a lot about the social deter determinants and spoke about trauma and poverty because I think the addiction piece is 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 the outcome piece of all of those. And I think it's it's good to try and keep that in our minds as, as we continue. I think the one um, final question... I I'd ask before I let you go is in relation to, I suppose, what has come up, say, from Deputy Kenny and, and, and then also, I think, Deputy McAuliffe 
in relation to that legalisation of, of cannabis piece um, and, and the fact that the, the vote was a particular way and I understand that. But the question I have is that do you think that if a question had been put to the Assembly, I know we can't go back and put a different question to the Assembly, but if the question had been put to the Assembly to look at the, uh, the, the, the model in uh, the likes of Malta, in the likes of Spain, where um, uh, uh, cannabis is not actually a profit, it's not the tourism piece, it's not the shops, it's not the, but it's the social clubs, you have to have a licence and you're allowed to grow a small amount. So do you think if a, an alternative question had it been put to the Assembly that wasn't a for-profit industry of legalisation of cannabis, do you think there may have been a different outcome given the conversations in the room? Yeah, we, we did have a presentation on that. Uh, Cran presented a similar model and we did from the MCDDA have presentations of all other countries. Look, as chair of it, and the assembly members are here with me, I believe the outcome was extremely tight, but it's reflective of that debate that's happening in society at the minute. And thankfully, as chair, I didn't have to cast my, my vote <laughs> on the day because it was extremely How tight. How would you cast it? I'm only messing <laughs> so, uh, so, look, I, I think it's reflective of the debate that's happening here. It's happening in the Oireachtas. It's happening in public society. It's happening in the debates. And there was a parallel debate happening, which we were quite happy with. And sorry, first of all, thanks to the political system that gave us the space to have that assembly process. But there was a parallel debate happening politically and, you know, on, on social media and on media in general. And we were very happy to see that happen. But you could see, you know, it, it wasn't a simple debate and it wasn't simple in the hall. Okay, but that didn't answer the question whether if there had been an alternative question that included only looking at the models of the likes of Malta and Germany rather than legalisation as a question in its universal sense because no. they are different. No, I, I, I'm very clear because it wasn't just about how the question was posed. Okay. It was about a whole six months debate that happened around all drugs and happened specifically about cannabis as well. Okay. So, no, I'm clear. I don't believe it would have been different. And if, if I could add, um, Senator, I don't think the... Um the decision was uh, rejecting just the idea of a commercialised cannabis market, because that wasn't that was going to be a follow-on question. If the vote had been in principle in favour of legalisation, then there would have been a series of follow-on questions. Well, what form of, of supply do you want? Do you want a state monopoly? Do you want home cultivation clubs, social clubs, etc.? Or do you want a commercialised market? Um, but we didn't get there because the principle of legalisation was rejected, albeit very narrowly. And I think the from what I understand the the presentations that were made uh, in favour of legalisation, there was some, you know, cogent arguments made around eliminating the criminal market, around improving the, the safety of, of supply, etc. But the, the one compelling argument that I think members picked up on was that the legalisation and the messaging that that gives leads to an uptake in prevalence, which in turn leads to a, an increase in the harms caused in society as general. So from a public health perspective, I think that was the kind of critical distinguishing factor between the vote supporting legalisation and the vote supporting an alternative approach. But the one thing we can say, and I think it's, it's clear, is that whether or not people voted in favour of legalising cannabis or simply uh, taking a comprehensive health care approach, both, both of those represent a paradigm shift, as the Chair said, away from the status quo. And I suppose it's just to put yeah. on the record then that just because it's not within the legalisation model, all drugs are to be decriminalised equally according to the model of the Citizens' Assembly. Yes, yes. correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And could I just go on record as saying as well, um, I think certainly from the roundtable discussions um, that I had on my table, I think one of the it was obviously a very close vote, and I think, as as Paul and Carl have stated, like that's very representative rep representative of where it is in society at the moment. But I think one of the key questions that was asked <coughs> um, by a member at my table was, if we legalise it, are we then sending the message that, hey, it's acceptable to be consuming drugs? Um, and on this case, it was it was an, an issue of, of cannabis, and the question was kind of posed in a way that, at our table, in our discussion, that do we want to send a message that, hey, we're, we, we're OK with kind of it's acceptable to be consuming? And, and then a, a, on a counterpoint, they said, so what's the difference between how acceptable it is to maybe consume a, a drug like cannabis versus a, a different drug? And where then does the distinction lie? And I think that was a big um, roundtable discussion of, 
okay, well, we, we don't maybe want to send that message of it's okay to do it, we, it's acceptable. I think it was more, it kind of, that's where the conversation pivoted on, on, on my table, certainly when it came to that vote. So I think I just want to go on record as saying you. that. Thank you. And I think um, just before, before we wrap up, um, um, Paul, before, as, as the chair, I suppose, of the Sims Assembly, is there any question that wasn't asked today that you wish was asked in relation to what you would like to see happen? No, I think it's a very good comprehensive discussion okay. across all ranges. Yeah, okay, thank you. just checking. <laughs> yeah. Grant, okay, thank you. Um, I would like to thank the witnesses. It's been extremely informative and obviously it makes sense that, that you were the, the first people in the room in terms of uh, the next seven months and uh, thank you for all the work, I suppose, and, 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 and clarity, I suppose, that's been given so far and uh, we're, we're very grateful. If I could ask the rest of the members to stay in the room, we will go into private meeting. Um, but the public meeting is now adjourned until Thursday the 20th of June. Thank you. Thank you.